All right, good evening, everybody. I'm gonna open up the meeting for the uh, November 18th meeting of the Wakefield Conservation Commission. Uh, we'll take a uh, roll call to start off. Uh, Jimmy. Teresa. I see you raising your hand. Here. Uh, let's see, Ken. Here. I don't see Frank yet. Frank yet. Peter. Peter. Peter, okay. And I know Savannah will not be here. Frank, are you there? I don't see Frank. All right, first item is the approval of the minutes from 1028. Anybody have any questions, comments on those minutes or would somebody like to make a motion uh, to approve those minutes? I'll make a motion. So approve. I, I was not there, so I'm not gonna vote on this. Okay, Jimmy, would you like to second that? Actually, we won't have a quorum uh, to approve those minutes. Also, we would like to uh, welcome our like members, Julie and Paul have joined us also. I will have to table the minutes. Um, unless Frank joins, unless Frank joins. Somebody's audio is really tough to hear. Oh, Peter's here now. Oh, Peter. Peter, now you're back. Peter. Still uh, tough to hear you though. Peter? Peter? Yeah, the audio is really poor. Yeah, yeah. Peter appears to be muted. Hi, it's Peter, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Peter, we do have a motion to approve the minutes. Would you like to second that? Yes. All right, Jimmy, did you vote yes? Jim? Jim's on mute right now. Yeah, right. I just unmuted now, him, but. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can. Okay, so yes. Okay, I also vote yes. So the minutes are approved for uh, 1028. All right, first item we're gonna cover here is uh, Millbrook Estates, it's DEP 313-322. And before we get into that, I will say that there are three, um, items on the agenda that are continued. Uh, we have 109 Farm Street, no file number. We have Camp Curtis Guild, also no file number. And we have Lake Street 313607, also continued. So if there's anybody here for Lake Street, Camp Curtis Guild or Farm Street, those have been continued. All right, so Millbrook States. Is there an applicant here for Millbrook? Yes, there is. Uh, Ryan Severance from uh, Moriarty, Troyer, and Malloy. Hello, Ryan. On behalf of... Hello, how are you? Good. So I'm here on behalf of the um, Millbrook Estates uh, Condominium Trust. Um, <clears throat> so I just kind of recently got this. Um, I know a letter was sent to the property manager, uh, to the trustees. Um, <clears throat> I spoke with Rebecca Davis a couple of times, uh, once on Tuesday and once earlier today. Um, and what she asked me to do was come on here and 
just give a brief status update of where we are. Unfortunately, um, we're not yet ready to apply uh, for the uh, certificate of compliance, um, <clears throat> but uh, the property manager is in the process of obtaining the maintenance records uh, for the stormwater management system. Um, and um, <clears throat> thanks to Rebecca, um, because the registry of deeds was no help, um, I was able to get uh, my hands on some of the original letters uh, that went back and forth between the uh, original developer of the condominium um, and the board uh, back in 2002, 2001. Um, and uh, was able to locate that uh, Hayes uh, Engineering was involved in the original planning of the stormwater management system. So uh, I placed a phone call today uh, to Hayes and uh, they're gonna look through their file, see what they can find for a plan for that system. Uh, unfortunately, a plan for that system was not recorded uh, with the registry. So uh, Hayes hopes they have one in their file. Um, there is a handwritten version of it in one of the communications um, that was provided to me by Rebecca uh, but certainly a more professional version would be better. Okay. Rebecca, uh, do you have any questions or anything to add? Rebecca is here. Okay. Elaine, yeah, for... Elaine, do you have anything to um, add or anything? Elaine now? Sorry. Yeah. I just unmuted myself. Um, I spoke to Rebecca this afternoon and she mentioned that, that uh, she had spoken with attorney Summers and that uh, it appears that Millbrook Estates is putting it together a good faith effort to uh, bring the property into compliance. And um, she just wanted the, uh, them to come in and speak with you tonight about that. She expects it to continue to go forward as they um, continue to work on the problem. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, uh, Ryan, do you have anything else for us or? I do not, I, I appreciate that little summary. And now that you know, we're alerted to the issue that the property manager is relatively new to the property that was previously managed by someone else. Um, and now that we're alerted to the issue, we're, we're gonna correct it. We'll, we'll get that certificate of compliance finally resolved. We'll, we'll get some maintenance records of, of the stormwater management system out there. Okay, great. Excellent. All right, thank you for the update. Absolutely, thank you. Okay. All right, uh, let's see, moving on. We still have a little bit of time to take care of some old business. Elaine, is there anything in particular you'd like to cover in the next uh, five minutes or so? We have the three tree removal requests. So each one of them has arborists letters. I've been out to each property and um, let's see, to take the first one at 38 Holland, the last time I spoke to you, you wanted to get more information on 38 Holland and you wanted to know how far the trees away were away from the wetland and how large they were. So for 38 Holland, it's two trees. One's a white pine with a four to five foot split and a hole in the trunk. It's located on the wetland edge, 11 feet from the house with an approximate 10 foot branch overhang. The other is a maple that's also on the wetland edge. It's 11 feet to the house deck, 21 feet to the house with a 15 foot overhang. Um, let's see, this property has a, um, an arborist letter that uh, from Keith's tree that says that the trees are hazardous uh, the white pine behind the garage has crown weight and is leaning towards the house. This is the one I saw the crack and the hole in. The maple behind the deck 
has a strong lead towards the house, also true. Both trees are encroaching on the house and are compromised, considered hazardous, pose a risk to the home and should be removed. <clears throat> okay. So that's 38 move? Holland. So um, that's 38 Holland. Are you, are you gonna, is there gonna be any mitigation for that? Well, yeah, that's a commission decision. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. I think, are we going to basically um, decide whether the tree, if the tree, the way I understand this, and I may be wrong, but if the tree is dead, it comes down with no, uh, nothing to be put back. But if the tree is alive and taken down, we would be looking for um, some replacement for it. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. It's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, these. Uh, what's the condition of the trees? Are they alive? Are they dead? They're both alive. And the proximity to the wetland is what? Or to a resource is what? It's on. <laughs> on the edge. It's on it's the, right edge. the edge. Yeah, it's right on it. It's on the edge of the wetland of the world. Yes. Is there a buffer zone here? Is it on the edge of the very edge of what wetland is it up against? I mean, well, Red Maple part? Swamp. Okay. In the back of the house, there's a retaining wall. Uh, in the back, and both of these trees are right at the retaining wall. Okay, so we would definitely want that replaced because that is. Did you say one of them was split? It has a split in the trunk plus a, a hole. Okay, so. If it's going to come down, we want to do some type of a replacement. Isn't that what we're doing? Well, does that also for a broken or diseased tree? That's a different situation, isn't it? Right. And one of them is clearly uh, damaged. Okay, it may be damaged, but is it offering anything as far as? protection to the resource. Well, it's a live damaged tree on the edge of the resource area. So I would say that we just want them to put something in to start growing again. Elaine, are, are there other trees nearby? Yes. Okay, it's I guess right on the edge of this. the swamp and it's a forested swamp. Okay, so I guess my point would be that if that tree, if that tree were cut down, would, would it provide room for other trees, adjacent trees to grow faster and fill in? I guess my point, the point that I guess I'm trying to imagine if it's the only tree anywhere near and it's providing, then it's a big deal, bigger deal than if there's trees everywhere around it and it's, and it, you know, and the other trees would just fill in over a period of years. I guess the other question I have too is the one that's split. If nothing were to occur, would that tree be coming down on its own or dying on its own? Well, I tell you, it's got it's got a hole in it, and from the look at the tree, uh, the look at the trunk rather, it's a vertical split. So it looks like it's weak enough that the wind has already torqued it. That's the only thing that I can think of that would create that vertical split. So it's weak. So, so Elaine, assuming that we, we, assuming that, that we agree the tree comes down and the only, and, and going back to what Jim said, would there be a material benefit to replacing the tree or is it likely that adjacent trees would, would, just grow, you know, would grow into the space such that it, it's not really, uh, I, I guess what I'm thinking of is just from a reasonable standpoint, um, is this something that, that would replanting another tree, um, 
likely provide a material benefit, or at least in the same place. I don't know whether we would want it someplace else or not. Well, a couple of things. One, the tree is so close to the retaining wall mm -hmm. that it appears as if it's growing out of the retaining wall itself. So you'd have to plant it back a little bit further into the swamp, at which point, at least the maple would have the same problem it has now. It would grow towards the sun. It would lean towards the house. All of its branches would be on one side. So if you ever tried to limit back, there'd be nothing left but a trunk. The, um, the pine tree, you know, it, it's got trees behind it. Um, if you were to, if you were to replace the pine, it would be shaded. It would not be particularly vigorous, I don't think. And I do think that if you cut the shade from the, it's a white pine. If you cut the shade from the pine, um, you would provide more sunlight to the other trees that are there now. Okay, so what are you saying that you don't need to replace those with any type of vegetation? You just cut them down and that's it. Is that where we're at right now? Are you going to require it be cut to a snag at 15 feet from the ground so that it provides habitat value? Could, Judy, could you say that again? I didn't hear all that. Are you going to require that they cut it as a snag so it's 15 feet up from the ground where it's cut so that it provides some habitat value? I never thought of that. I don't know. It's in the policy. Yeah, I, I just. Yeah. And where it's, it's over the retaining wall, it seemed like a perfect spot for something like that. Or Rather than cut it to the ground. Okay, well, what does the homeowner think? Do they have any opinion? What would be the downside to having a snag? I'm, I'm just asking what the homeowner, if the homeowner has any opinion on it. I don't have a problem with the snag either. The last, the home, uh, last I spoke to the homeowner, his desire was to have the trees just removed. I'm not sure he considered a snag. Okay. Um, so if you're going to have, allow the maple to come down, are you going to have them pay into the habitat replacement fund? Elaine, I, I guess I need to clarify a question uh, yes. first. If, are either one of those trees, would either one of those trees coming down alter, or potentially alter the resource area? They would allow more sunlight in to the trees that are there now. It's a red maple swamp, so there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, trees. Uh, uh, like Peter. Peter, there's a lot of background noise. I just muted you. Sorry. So Elaine, you were saying if um, if either one of those trees came down, would they or could they alter the resource area? Or is there enough canopy uh, in place now where it wouldn't make much of a difference? There's a lot of canopy behind these two trees. It would make a difference in that it would increase sunlight in the area that is now shaded by them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, I think, Elaine, I'm going to go by your judgment on this. I think um, I think they should just be able to take the trees down. And, and uh, I mean, it would be nice if they could plant something. I mean, are the trees themselves, are they big trees that are coming down? I mean, uh, yeah, the, the white pine is 
50 so, feet. The maple is 35, maybe. Okay, so one thing we know for sure is that the plants would grow there if we replace it with another pine or something because that's what's there now and it's doing well. So um, I, I wouldn't be opposed to having them put something in there to grow. Does anyone feel the same way or what's any other opinions? Yeah, I mean, it's not a bad idea to put something back there. Um, and also to Judy's point, leaving a, you know, uh, a snag of some type. Yeah, but this, the, the trunk of this thing must be big. So what are you gonna leave something, you know, 15 feet in the air that's... Well, it could be, it could be eight feet. Between eight and 15 feet is suitable for a snag. I don't see what, how harmful that can be. Well, if, you, if you leave the snag there, you can't replace it with another, another planting, so. But you wouldn't replace it in the same place. Otherwise you'd have to grind the stump down. And is it going to, to Elaine's point, it's so close to the retaining wall, is it gonna then create the same problem? Mm. So why not have them make a donation to the Habitat Replacement Fund because what are the chances it's going to be replanted? Instead of a new tree, make the- Yes. Or how about point, planting some shrubs of some type back near the edge of the wall? Yeah, that's another idea. What's, what's that? You know, the, ben the benefit of shrubs as opposed to money is you're putting food right out there. Right. And you donate money, you're not quite sure where or when that tree is going to get planted. And again, we'd be providing shade too. Where would you put the shrubs? Well, uh, the thing about the shrubs is they have shallower roots. You could put the shrubs in the corner of the lot on top of the retaining wall. Hmm. Or I could find a shrub that does better in shade that could be planted down towards the bottom. But the shrubs are, I think homeowners like shrubs because they're pretty often when they bloom, they're not trouble to keep, they're small um, and they don't mind them. They don't, uh, it, people, people can get afraid of trees but they're not gonna get afraid of shrubs. Yeah, and right. then they fruit out, which is nice and it provides food just where you have, water so shrubs have a lot of benefits i agree so why don't we suggest that the trees come down and some shrubs get put uh up wherever they make sense back there and then there has to be um they have six months to plant them so then there's a site visit at six months okay That seems like a very reasonable approach. I, and I think that what I'm learning from these is that every situation seems different and we, and we need to be flexible and reasonable. But, but I like the fact that we're, we're, we know we're taking a little bit of a step back in terms of habitat and we're doing something to, uh, we're doing, you know, we're doing something. Um, in, you know. Yeah. How many shrubs would you like to see? Well, the policy gives a guideline on, on what's, uh, Recommended, correct? Yeah, two large shrubs yes. or three small shrubs for each tree. Okay. Okay. Does that take and what about the... and it, does that also include the um um you still want the snag there? I do. <laughs> I don't see any harm to having the snag there and it provides habitat value. Yeah, I mean, do they call a tree stump a snag? I thought yes, the branch they do. is laying on the ground. No, was... no, that's a branch. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I don't know if it's-, if it's It is even... called a snag. I'm gonna send you the definition. Okay, because I don't know how beneficial that is. A stump it provides habitat for birds in the, well, the birds in the have, buds. The birds can land in the trees. They hollow it out and they live inside. That's where owls live. And then the bugs eat it and it breaks down and creates okay. more nutrients. 
It's all about the Judy, biodiversity, you, Jimmy. Judy, were you thinking of one snag or two snags? Because there's two trees. Two. two. And would a snag for a big tree, like that big pine tree, be is that is that beneficial be as a snag for a smaller tree where they can be? It can be eight feet, and that's fine. Okay. Um, Elaine, would eight feet bring the pine below the split? You know what? I uh, yeah, I think so. I would certainly tell. I would certainly suggest. Yeah, I think it should put it right just below it. Because obviously we want to be below that be below that split, or you know, now you have something falling. Okay. All right, are we good with the uh, Holland Road? You all set with that one, Elaine? Yes, I'm all set. All right, so I've got uh, almost 7.30, so we're gonna actually move on um, to Corner Powett Parkway, DEP 313608. Uh, okay. Who's here for Corner Powett? Great, thank you. Uh, this is Nick Delacaba with Allen & Major Associates, Civil hey, Engineers hey. for the project. Uh, also with me tonight is Ian Ramey, principal over at Copley Wolf, the landscape Hello. architects for the project. And I believe Matt D'Amico representing the applicant. I don't know if he's here yet, but he'll probably jump on. Okay. Um, Ian, it's probably, can I just share my screen and then I can hand it over to you? Does that work? Yeah, I have sure. three I slides. Allison from my office is going to run our slideshow. So yeah, you can go ahead and then she'll do hers. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay, so at the last hearing, um, oh, is it paused? Why does it say it's paused? Can you see the plan? Yeah, we can see the, um, the site plan, yes. Can you see my cursor? Uh, no. I don't know why it says it's paused. Yeah, I think you had that same issue last time. How's this? Yep, got it now. Okay. All right, so at the last hearing, uh, we were focusing primarily on the stormwater management system and some of the components involved with that and how we were going to treat the stormwater leaving the site and reduce the nutrient loads entering the lake. Um, since then, over the last several weeks, we've made some adjustments to the um, overall layout of the site that I wanted to go over briefly with you uh, before I handed it off to Ian, uh, who's going to take the focus on uh, landscape uh, for tonight's discussion. So this is the site plan that I think everyone's most familiar with and what we've been showing to date. Of course, we have the, the parkway surrounding the development parcel, our neighborhood drive that comes between building three uh, and one and two. We had the three separate primary courtyards throughout building three, two of which were home to the bioretention areas. We had our single tray surface lot to the left of building three where my cursor is here, and uh, a double tray of parking to the right of building three here. We had the loading zones off the back side of the building at the rear of the parkway with the entrance to the garage. We had this meandering path behind buildings one and two, uh, and surrounding that path were, was that uh, larger infiltration basin. We also had the wet basins along the perimeter of the parkway. So I'm going to switch to the latest design. Uh, it is very similar to what was previously proposed. Uh, really what we've done here is mirror building three and swapped the surface lot. So uh, there's a single tray of parking to the right of building three now, and the double tray has been moved to the left. I'll swap back real quick just so you can see. Parking garage is in the center and it's moved to the right. So we've swapped the parking trays and shifted building three to the right. We maintained uh, 
The three primary courtyards, we still have a buyer retention in two of them, the pool area in the middle. Buildings one and two uh, remain largely unchanged. They're still in the same location. They're not any closer to the lake. Uh, we have the path along the back side of building one and two. We've moved that, uh, we positioned it so it connects back to the existing trails off the property uh, on the Lowell Street side, as well as the North Ave side down here. So what that's done is it's actually opened up uh, more room in the backs of building one and two for uh, the infiltration system or the infiltration basin. And that basin provides additional nutrient removal uh, going into the lake. The previous design, we had about 80% total nutrient load reduction. Uh, with this design, we have about upwards of 90%. So it's an improvement over, over the previous design. We've also incorporated a dog park, the top right corner of building three, which Ian will discuss in more detail. Uh, we've maintained all the same wet basins along the edge of the uh, parkway. The parkway hasn't moved. The grading remains this, consistent with what you've seen to date. Uh, the compensatory flood storage uh, within that parkway remains consistent with what you've seen to date. So nothing there has changed. We still have, again, all the bioretention areas. We have the underground chambers below the surface parking uh, and the larger infiltration basin at the back of the site. We've also included uh, 11 parallel spaces, four of which are to the left of the double tray of parking right off the parkway. And we have another seven proposed uh, to the right of the single tray of parking right off the parkway. So I think, I think that covers the majority of, of the updates for the site. Uh, and again, I'll swap back real quick. This was the previous design. This is the new. It's really just mirroring building three and then swapping the, the two trays of parking. And the primary reason for moving this parking over here was to keep it in closer proximity to the proposed restaurant use where my cursor is at the uh, far left wing of building one. And just as a quick addition, uh, Matt Tamiko, project manager at CCNF, um, I, with, with our next, uh, for our next meeting in December, uh, we will come prepared with uh, the formal resubmission of the notice of intent um, to reflect this. But we just felt that, you know, the land, you know, whether we were using these buildings or the previous buildings, that the landscape for the purposes of CONCOM jurisdiction um, would be consistent. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll have all that information ready for the next meeting. So are there any initial questions before I hand it off to Ian to go over the landscape improvements? Hearing none, I will stop sharing my screen, Ian, and hand it over to you. Well, let me Thanks, ask you Nick. Before you go, get off of that, um, we had talked about the direction of the stream flow. What did you discover on that? Uh, I believe Goddard Consulting went out there and did some explorations in the field. I don't know if there's anyone here with Goddard tonight to discuss so, that. Uh, this is Mark Arnold with Goddard Consulting. Um, Mitch Malaska and I have been looking into that question that the commission had raised, and uh, we're still making sure we get enough information to uh, provide adequate response to the commission. So that's pending. Um, again, we'll also be out there with uh, the peer reviewer looking at some of the wetland lines and other things. Um, and so we'll hopefully get that all summed up for the next meeting. Okay. When you put out these revised plans, uh, are they going to show the uh, where you did your uh, test pits? Yes. Yep. And are you putting elevations on these plans? Yes, it'll be a full revised plan set. Yeah, it'll be revised, but will it show elevations? You don't show elevations on your plans. Yes, uh, it shows up on the grading and drainage plan. Sheet C103, I believe. Okay. I'm all set for right now. 
Yeah, so I think it would make sense. We, you know, we prepared, uh, Kim prepared with um, our landscape presentation as well as our, um, some information on site lighting as well. Um, so I, um, I think it makes sense to turn it over to Copley Wolf Design Group who's been working uh, exclusively on that landscape component. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everybody. Again, my name is Ian Ramey. I'm a principal and landscape architect at Copley Wolf Design Group in Boston. And with me is Allison uh, DeBonet. She's the project landscape designer working with me. Uh, we're gonna run through some slides really quickly that uh, go over the gist of the landscape design um, and then take some questions. So um, I think you can scroll through these. These are the ones that uh, Nick already presented the comparison of the before and after. So we just wanted to start really quick. You guys are obviously familiar with the existing site conditions. Um, as it relates to the landscape condition out there, there really isn't a lot of landscape. What is out there right now is lawn, which is poorly drained, and a few scattered trees, uh, some of which are dead, uh, many of, of which are not native, some are invasive species. Uh, but largely, you know, 70% of the site of the developable area is covered by impervious surface. And that's constituted by dark colored asphalt, dark colored uh, roofs, uh, which is obviously a huge heat island gain factor, not a lot of shade on site. And in general, the site drainage is poor, as you know, with a lot of untreated uh, runoff going into the resource areas. Next slide. And then just some key characteristic photos of the existing uh, conditions at grade. Again, a lot of pavement, a lot of poorly drained conditions out there. Uh, the lawn that's out there um, is also not uh, well drained. There's standing water. Uh, there are invasive species for sure. Uh, there's some dead trees and underperforming trees out there. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide. And so here's the proposed site plan. Um, and as Nick was getting into, uh, we really sort of have four different zones to the landscape design. The first zone is this rain garden and multi-use path area, which is the open space that's adjacent to the property line with the park between the park boundary and the smaller buildings. That's where we have our system of rain gardens and the multi-use path. Um, between the two buildings, we have our neighborhood street, as we call it, which is a tree-lined um, uh, road that goes through at a residential scale. It has uh, raised crossing tables for the pedestrians to kind of pass between the two sides of the, of the, uh, the two buildings in a safe manner. The third component are the courtyard spaces. There's three courtyards associated with the larger building. That's where we have some of the amenity spaces as well as some of the smaller open spaces and, and rain garden areas. Uh, we have a large central courtyard that is between the two small buildings that looks out onto the lake and has some amenity aspects to it. Uh, we also have a small dog area in the upper right-hand corner of the large building. And then I guess the fourth component to mention is sort of this perimeter landscape, the landscape that's associated with the parkway drive that goes around the east, north, and west sides of the property. And within there, there's some conservation areas that we are proposing. Generally, our overall approach to the landscape design is that we're looking to employ nature-based solutions, green infrastructure, um, to take a more ecologically restorative approach compared to what's out there today, which is again, lawn and, and a few scattered trees, uh, really trying to increase the amount of native trees and understory for more biodiversity. And overall, we have about 6.2 acres of new landscape open space associated with this um, project. Next slide. So in terms of the different types of landscape, we have uh, different typologies depending where on the site and what the function is. So the first uh, typology to call out is the rain garden. And again, that happens between the property line with the park and the smaller buildings. So in that area, we have this ribbon of hydrologically connected basins that uh, sort of weave in with this multi-use path there'll be a series of footbridges that allow uh, the path to pass over the rain garden, but allow the water below to kind of conduct itself between those basins so that they're all connected. The next typology is the wet basin system, which is on the outer edges of the existing parkway and adjacent to the resource area. 
These are depressed areas, as you know, that have uh, some amount of standing water and plants that are suited to that type of application. And for each of these different zones, we have some um, more detail that we'll get into as we go through the slides. The third typology is the conservation area. That is um, uh, tied to where the wet basins are. So basically at the higher elevations around the wet basins is where we have this conservation area, trying to um, take a more sensitive approach to those adjacent resources. The fourth component is what we call the tree canopy. So that's shown with the um, orangish um, uh, graphic on here. And you can see that we're really trying to increase the amount of shade provided by the trees. And then the fourth or the fifth component rather is the site planting, which is just the general landscapes that is up against the buildings and within the courtyards and around the paths and roadways uh, that will be primarily um, relying on native material, but there'll also be some adapted non-native materials that will be selected for their uh, performance as um, you know, highly ornamental uh, species. Next slide. So now we'll sort of get into the detail of each of these different typologies. Uh, the first one is the rain garden. And so the graphic in the upper left uh, demonstrates how that works. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to point out is that the um, finished grade of the rain gardens is at elevation 86, and the measured groundwater is at about elevation 81. So that's a five foot difference between um, the finished grade of that rain garden and the top of the water uh, that we know is in the ground. Uh, there's about two feet of filtration and treatment and drainage and so forth that's within that uh, rain garden section that's been presented previously. And the point here is that these are perched above the, uh, the groundwater and they're intended to dry out between storm events. So they will draw, draw down and be a dry condition and not have standing water um, between the, the storm events. The species that are selected for that are equipped to take the occasional inundation, but also can tolerate uh, periods of drought. Uh, these will be all native species. The images at the bottom show some of the plant compositions of um, how we see these, these being planted. Um, and also are noting here some of the uh, other benefits that obviously some of these um, native plants have for the birds and the bees, um, things that are gonna be of high value to the um, local wildlife. Next slide. And then we have the wet basins, which unlike the rain gardens, will have water in them uh, more frequently. Um, the elevation of 81 is where we believe the water will be. Um, and because there will be water present there, we have a different type of plant that's proposed there. Um, it'll largely be a combination of cattails and also uh, arrow arum, uh, plants that can uh, basically survive and thrive in aquatic conditions. So those will be the plants that are at the edges and within the first few feet of, of the water area. And then above the mean high water area, we'll have the riparian zone where we'll have um, plants that are similar to what's being used in the rain gardens. So there'll be species that can take more frequent inundation, but also um, don't need it to survive. They can take drier conditions as well. Um, and in this area, it's uh, species that are 100% native, um, and we're sort of highlighting here some of the value that they provide to the local wildlife. So larval hosts for the butterflies, um, things for um, you know, berries for the nesting birds, egg laying amphibians will be able to utilize this area, um, hunting and hiding grounds for the dragonflies. Um, there's the whole series of benefits that the plant materials will provide to uh, the local wildlife. And then above and around the wet basins, we have uh, what we're calling the conservation area. So this is a, a landscape that's comprised of seed mixes and smaller caliper uh, trees or whips that will be planted. Um, the idea here is that we're replacing the lawn that's in place with a lower level of uh, maintenance required. So this would be a no mow or low mow area uh, that will over time reestablish itself as sort of a native meadow. Um, it won't require irrigation or fertilization and will become 
um, an area of habitat basically that borders around the wet basins and then is adjacent to um, the existing resource. And in terms of the trees, um, uh, right now there's a handful of species on site. Uh, we're looking to greatly diversify um, the planting of trees in terms of the species. Uh, we're proposing all native species and species of trees that are of high value from various types of oaks uh, to tupelos, red maples, river birches, American elms, and some evergreens such as um, the white pine. Next slide. This is a graphic that just uh, tries to depict um, the existing condition versus the proposed. So the graphic on the top shows um, the range of species and the quantities that are out there uh, proportionally, many of which are non-native and some of which are invasive species. The graphic that's on the bottom is representing the increase in biodiversity, but also the increase in the quantity of trees. Um, again, and all the species that we'll, we will be planting for the trees will be native species. And then for the understory, um, we have a collection of shrubs, perennials, ground covers, um, all of which in the resource areas will be native. Uh, these will be um, plants that also have a lot of ornamental value, obviously, uh, between their flower and fruit and winter habit. Um, but also will provide uh, various uh, benefits to the local wildlife. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, these are some of the species um, having uh, consulted with Goddard Consulting um, that will be uh, the recipients of the benefits of um, the proposed plantings. So everything from birds to small ground mammals to bats um, will all see a benefit from the new planting of the landscape. Next slide. So this slide talks about the tree mitigation. The graphic that you see shows a combination of the proposed tree plantings. Those are the, the brighter green. Um, the darker green circles are the existing trees that are either um, transplanted or retained. And then the sort of more olive colored circle green is uh, the proposed whips that I mentioned earlier. So in total, um, the existing trees on site, there are 42 existing trees, six of which are currently dead. That leaves 36 living trees. Of those 36 living trees within this developable area, 24 will be retained either in place or if they're small enough, we think we can move them. Um, and then 12 will be removed um, by virtue of how the buildings sit and by virtue of how some of the site grades have to get manipulated in order to create the rain gardens. Uh, and I'll just say that in terms of the, the biomass, so there's about 364 dBH inches of existing trees that will be removed. What's being put back in combination with the uh, whips and the larger caliper nursery grown trees is 638 inches. So we're exceeding uh, what's being removed quite considerably. Next slide. And then in terms of the lighting, uh, so the strategy for the site lighting along the parkway, which is that outer perimeter of the site, is that uh, the existing light poles that are there will remain. The fixtures that are on them will be um, discarded and replaced with higher efficiency asymmetrically uh, distributing LED fixtures. So we can really control the spread of light and the new fixtures will have the ability to have full horizontal cutoff as well as again with asymmetrical distribution only cast light on the areas where uh, we want it to be which is on the road and not at the resource area behind. Um, and then in terms of the interior to the site where we have pedestrian areas, we have new LED fixtures um, primarily post tops, which would be along the streets, the interior street and the walkways at about a 12 foot high, those will be LED as well. And then along the multi-use path uh, for safety lighting, we'll have a series of low bollard lights that will also be LED um, and have the ability to have full cutoffs and asymmetrical distributions. And with that, I think that's our last slide.
Yep, that's it. So thank you. Um, happy to take any questions. I have something, this is Elaine. I have something about the trees. Yep. You mentioned that you were gonna plant white pines, but aren't white pines in the middle of a blight right now? I have some um, concerns about them. Be, they're dying everywhere. They've got a blight. I have some concern they would not survive. Well, we haven't seen a, a huge decline in them. I mean, I, it's hard to find species that don't have some type of a pathogen that's affecting them. Um, we're certainly open to changing those out. Um, the reason we selected the white pines for this project is because there are some existing mature ones out there. And we thought that that would be an opportunity to maybe increase that a little bit more, but um, we're certainly open to changing that. We do want to have some form of evergreen, native evergreen represented in that tree list though. Yeah, I like white pines too. Um, I, I guess um, my understanding is that there is a blight. I, I do see a lot of them thinning out and dying in places. If you would just look into that and sure. just yeah, I know that. Look like into the, a little bit more and and think about it and see if you still want to go forward with it. Okay. Yeah, I know that the I mean, eastern hemlocks are are really struggling, obviously, with the woolly adelgid, but I'm not as right. familiar with the white pines being sick. But I'll I'll look into that. Yeah, I am seeing a lot of them. A lot of them thin out and die. And the other the other thing I had was about the oaks. Mm -hmm. um, I too am greatly in favor of oaks. I think they're like a keystone species. Mm -hmm. The only concern I have is oaks that are planted too close to walkways, because as they grow and they have an excellent crop in a particular year, you have mm -hmm. acorns all over the walkway. People start complaining about slipping and falling. And the next thing you know, 15 years down the road, people want to take out those oaks because of all the acorns they're dropping. So, um, I would just recommend that you be judicious about where they go in so that 15 years from now, a conservation commission isn't looking at people complaining about the safety hazard of the oak trees and the acorns um, where they slip and fall all over the walkways. Okay, that's a good comment. I, I think we definitely have open areas that are free of walkways and driveways and things like that where we could, we could probably locate yeah, them. Yeah, that'd be the place to put them. Okay. Could you click back to the uh, landscape? I mean, sorry, the lighting slide. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Would all of these lights be on throughout the entire night or would there be some sort of lights out period for some of them or what's the plan? I think we have the ability to have uh, solar sensors so that they can turn off and timers and things like that. I don't see the need for them to be on all the time. I think, I think it would be a variety, right? So on Kwanapau Parkway where it's technically a private way, but used kind of as a public utility. I think, you know, I, I think those lights would likely be on, um, but there's a lot more flexibility in terms of, you know, surrounding the site. I think there's some, you know, some, there, there's gonna wanna be some desire, especially, you know, for safety concerns uh, in some areas where you'd wanna have some level of lighting. Um, but by and large, I mean, you, you could definitely turn down a lot of these lights you know, later in the night. Okay. I do like the 3000 Kelvin color, um, you know, getting into that softer, uh, more natural looking light, much better than the, um, you know, higher Kelvin colors, you know. Yeah, so we'll probably want to think about what lights would be on and, and which ones would be uh, out at a certain time as we move along to the project. Sounds good. All right, any other questions from the commission? 
You know, what is the water level at the lake? Do you know what the elevation is? Uh, Nick, do you know that? Yes, I believe it's around elevation 78, but it fluctuates. The lake's uh, dam controlled. Yeah, I know it is, but it's, it's high, right? When did you last check that? Uh, that was based on Haley and Aldrich's uh, subsoil exploration report that they pulled together. But you, okay, but that would have been different than getting it at the lake itself, right? No, of course, but as part of that um, investigation, they noted the elevation of the lake. Okay. I can try to pull that up. Because I think, um, from what I understand, um, the lake is high now anyways. It's probably higher than it normally is. I just didn't know um, if that would affect you at all. So you're saying 81 is, you're thinking about water table at. Yeah, so the 81 is actually a conservative number. When we were out there doing test pits, uh, the groundwater in some of the pits were around elevation 77, uh, some were at 79. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, the the highest or shallowest groundwater that we observed was at elevation 81. And uh, the town engineer, Bill Renault, he advised us that he'd like us to use that 81 elevation as a basis for our seasonal high groundwater throughout yeah. our design. But, but how does that affect your wet basins? So the wet basins, the, the finished grade of the bottom of the basin is at elevation 80. So, so you could uh, be two we feet expect... above the water, right? Sorry, say that again? You, you could be two feet above the water table then? We expect the seasonal high to be about a foot above uh, the wet basin, the basin, the, the lower finished grade of the basin, the basin bottom. So you, you expect the water, you expect to have like a foot of water in the basin then? Is that right? Correct. But that's quite a bit of difference between that and what you're getting for a reading at the lake. Well, if you look at the adjacent wetlands right next to these wet basins, yeah, uh, I mean, there's water in the in the stream right there. There's water yeah. right up almost to the parkway in some locations at any given time, uh, and that's around elevation 81. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna uh, we have those reports anyways about the uh, that form eleven or whatever it was where you took the test bits. That's correct. Yes. Okay. When were the test pits dug? Uh, I'll tell you right now. It was this year. Uh, June. Yeah. June 3rd. Okay. June 3rd. And they yeah, were out there two days, June 2nd and June 3rd. Okay. And the and the elevations are around 78, 79, right? The elevations in the, of the seasonal high that they of the, of the water in the test pit when you hit yes. water. Yep. And that's noted on our grading and drainage plan. It was actually those test pits are on the current plans that you have on file, uh, they're just shaded back. So it, I can see why it was a little bit difficult to find. On the next plans, we've made them a little bit more apparent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Three thousand degrees Kelvin. What color is that? That's so like you're almost around your incandescent bulb, Jimmy. Oh, Incandescent is probably in the twenty seven hundred range. I know, but what color does that give off? Remember, they were talking about colors from. Yeah, from it's a yellow. It's a yellowish, natural like incandescent color. At yeah, the lower the good, level. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good color. You want to stay away from the the blues, you know, in the whatever seven eight thousand range of what you don't want. What you do want is that three thousand range. Okay. It mimics more natural light. Okay. I did confirm in the um, in Haley and Aldrich's report. Uh, they approximate the the lake at elevation seventy nine. Yeah, yeah. I, I I just think I keep thinking that there's a difference in there that doesn't make sense to me. But I'm just gonna keep looking at it until it does. Uh, we also were told that the um, missing flags have been rehung out there. Yeah, so we'd like, I'd like to be on the site walk for that. And uh, actually, we need to schedule a site walk, right? Yeah. Yeah, so all the new, all the flags are back out where they should be. Are there any other questions from the commission at this time? Are there any questions from the public at this time? I just have one question. Ahead, how, many, how many plants do you think you're going to plant out there in total? I mean, I'm just curious. It seems like you got a, a major, major amount of plants. There's certainly a lot of plants. Uh, we don't have a final plant count yet because we haven't got to that level of, of intricate detail, but um, you know, there'll be a lot of very small material, smaller size material to, in order to cover that area. Mm. So do you think um, you know, the plantings that you do, would you say how far, how long would it be before they mature to the, the mature level that you expect them to? To be to cover the area you want. I mean, what type of a time frame are we talking? Uh, probably within three to four years, they would they would do their thing. What size trees would initially be planted? You may have already covered that. Yeah, uh, I think I have this on a list. Let me see. So the tree species uh, for the larger caliper material ranges. Um, some of the species are three to three and a half inches. Some are two to two and a half inch caliper. And then when we talk, sorry. What height does that put you at for, for a tree of three to four inch caliper, whatever it is? What height on, do you expect on, to have the trees to be? On day one when they get installed? Yeah. yeah. yeah so. A three inch caliper tree is going to be about 15 to 16 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And then the two to two and a half is going to be a couple feet lower. So probably depends on the species, but they will be 14 or so feet. And then the whips will be an inch to an inch and a half um, caliper. So smaller and they'll be, they tend to be kind of tall and gangly when they first come in. So they might be, you know, six or seven feet, but not have a very big crown initially. Okay, any other questions from the commission? No. Elaine, do you have any other questions at this time? No, I don't. I do not. Okay. 
All right, there's a question from the public. Uh, Dennis, I see your hand raised. Would you like to go? Thank you for your time. Uh, the Patriots are playing, so I'll be as brief as possible. I would just like to see if the um, the uh, if I can open a file here. Yeah. Um, can, can we get that picture off the screen so we can see everyone? Okay. So I'm I'm going to share screen, right? Can 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 I do that? Yes, you can. Okay. Now I'm going to open. Uh, a file. If I can do this. Okay. And. And so Dennis, you have to select the image picture or whatever it is that you want to share. You have to click on it. Can you see that image? No. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thank you for your time. I will keep you with, without images. Um, it's, it's really hard to explain, and I know I have a, I'm not good at explaining things, but I served on the uh, Corner Power Study Committee, and we studied the lake for years and years. But how this affects me is that when they built 128, uh, they cut off our direct access. Uh, we used to have, uh, just go, we, we could just go down Harvest Road. And, but when they built 128, and how this affects me is that when they built 128, they put a pipe underground, under 128, which, which drains the whole neighborhood. And they didn't put any drainage ditches on this, this side of the road. So the whole, everything goes under the highway and it uh, connects to a drainage ditch that runs down to Walker's Brook. Now, uh, I heard you discussing earlier about uh, Walker's Brook not completing its flow into the lake. Like it, like it's, um, it used to, uh, I remember when, when a commission member put up that map that showed how the river flowed into the lake, the Saugus River, the, and the, well, anyways, it goes down to a drainage ditch. And uh, because they said they wanted to fill some land, raise, raise up some land, but those, that land is being used as a retention pond for, because water is, having a difficult time because it can't, Walker's Brook cannot complete its journey into the lake. So what, it, what the water is doing is it goes, it goes into retention ponds and then it slowly drains down to the Walker's Brook. It goes upstream and into this, what they call the Saugus River overflow. Hey, I know the I, I mailed a bunch of pictures uh, to Elaine, and uh, I sent it something by drop mail, and it, it explains it a lot better than I can without pictures. So, if, I don't know if we have those available. I sent them today. I I, I got in today. I wasn't in last week with the holiday and I sent them, they're all in your emails. I sent them late this afternoon. Oh. So if you don't have a chance to look at them now, you will certainly have them 
you probably should look at them before you go out on the site visit if you're interested in how the water runs, but you, you all have them in your inbox and in your emails. And, you know, and if and also, if I could say one more thing, I mean, you, we know we have an algae problem in the lake. And if, if you allowed Walker's Brook to flow into the, um, into the lake and allowed the Sargas River to flow in the lake and took away those two dams and took away the dam at the outlet to the lake, I think it would go a long way to solving your algae problem. And I think even the applicant would be very happy about that too. Elaine, can I just ask you, when did you send that email? Because I don't have any emails from this afternoon. I don't have five, any. maybe. Did not come in, Elaine. You, you guys, this is Peter. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to drop off. I'm, we're pushing back from the gate, and I'm going to they're going to make me go in airplane mode. So. Um, hey, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your captain, Tony Gizelbach. Hey, Peter. Our first officer, Derek. We'd like to add our welcome. Have a good flight, Peter. Yeah, I don't have that email either. Um, Elaine, can you resend that email, Elaine? I can ask Rebecca to send it Tuesday. I won't be back in the office tomorrow. Yeah, but I can that's ask fine. To send it we'll I sent it out. I sent it as a group mail to the Conservation Commission. Hmm. Nobody's need... got it. No, but you know no. what? It might be in the Conservation Commission um, right. email box. Elaine, oh. we don't get those individually, Elaine. You what? We don't get, if you send it to the Conservation Commission without our individual emails, we don't get them. All right. I'll see that they get sent again. I'm sorry hey. about that. I find all these new email addresses just a little confusing. I, I just I wish we had just one of them. Oh. Who got I, it? I, nope, nope. I was looking at the wrong thing. My bad. Sorry about that. All right. So obviously it went. I'm sorry about that. I, I will send it to another email address and I'm sure that one will be the right one. All right, so Dennis, we'll take a look at those when we get them and we can discuss that further at the next meeting. Yeah, thank you, it seems to be on the agenda. Um, it's a large file, it's like 121 megabits. So um, it, I had to send it through Dropbox. It, it may have got blocked. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, I, will, uh, I also we'll, dropped a physical copy off at the uh, uh, at the uh, town hall. Okay, we'll figure it out for the next meeting. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from the public? All right. Is there anything we're looking for? for the next meeting for Corner Power. Well, we want to get results from our consultant. Yeah. Right. And we were waiting for those results before scheduling a site visit, right? Yes. I'm sorry to hear that. We were waiting for the results the, uh, the, the report from our consultant before scheduling a site visit. Um, the flags are all up right now, I believe, right? Yeah, they're all up. There's a note from um, Rebecca, the flags have right. been redone. So, and BSC so, will organize a site visit. Okay, so that's the, that's the way we'll do it. And, Has there been any uh, feedback from BSC as to when they expect they might receive or it might be coming up on the peer review? Mm. Mm. When? Well, yes. Well, they have to. Um, well, we need to schedule a site visit so we can move it along. No, Matt asked about the report, not the visit. Oh, the report. Yeah, but we can't do a report without the visit. So their, their report, our consultant's report, is contingent on all walking the site with them? 
I want to walk the site with them. I know that. I know, but Matt, Matt asked a different question. All right, what's Matt's question? I, I, I was just curious if there was any feedback from BSCS to timing. Uh, oh, either way, you know, we're well, fully just, amenable to doing a site walk whenever the commission right. is supposed well, to. Well, I just it. learned tonight that that the, the flags were hung and that um, and they were going to schedule a site for us. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting for them to tell us. Maybe Rebecca can call tomorrow and see you know, what their schedule is, when they're going to get out there, if that's what you're worried about. That sounds good. We'll be fully amenable to whatever schedule that is. OK. All right. So we'll be uh, continuing to the next meeting, which is December. When is the next meeting? December 9th, I believe. Yes, December 9th. OK, that sounds great. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Good night. All right, let's see. Next up, we have EP313553, which is 84 New Salem Street. It's a request for an extension and review changes. Uh, this is Commonwealth Tank and um, Stormwater Pipe. Is there somebody? Dave Beagle, uh, representing Com Tank, and I'm with uh, our engineer, uh, Carlton Quinn. And so we're asking for an extension because of we, we had dug some test pits and encountered some problems with the gas lines and the sewer line and the uh, Verizon duck bank. And the original, uh, I'll, I'll let Carlton explain uh, where we started uh, relative to the test pits down the street from our property and where we ended up across from our property because of the field conditions. Carlton? Yeah, I'm here, dude. Can you explain that? Uh, happy to. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Carlton Quinn. I'm with Alan and Major Associates. Um, as Dave mentioned, we're seeking an extension um, for this um, order of conditions because um, we've been we had some issues with the original design when we started digging test pits and started confirming where the gas lines were in the street. Um, we had assumed that they were behind the tank based on record plans along the property lines. Um, but when we went out there and dig saved it and, and dug a test pit to, to find the actual location, um, they became very burdens, burdensome, burdensome to the design that we had put together. And um, we basically were told there's no way that anyone's moving any gas lines for this project. So we've been, since that point, um, we've been going back and forth with the town's um, engineering department to come up with an alternative concept that kind of meets the spirit of what we had proposed before. Um, and I think we've we've gotten there. Um, we've been back and forth with um, Mr. Renault for the past few months. Um, and I finally got to a design that I think we both think um, is adequate for what we're doing. Um, I'm happy to share that with you now. I, I don't know if you've got, gotten plans. This was kind of a last minute um, meeting. Um, yeah, we did get some late this afternoon, but yeah, it would well, certainly be good to share it with us. Okay, let me, I can uh, go through that pretty quickly here. Um, so here is our original design. Um, basically, we have an existing drainage system on site that's not connected to anything. Um, this was built several years ago. And at some point, um, the, the, the goal was to cross the street. Um, and again, this, this design dates back 10 years or so ago. Um, but due to some litigation problems, it's just getting pushed farther and farther back to the point that we've actually went to break ground this year on it and um, ran into these issues. So we were catching the stormwater on site. Um, it's discharging to a water quality device. Mm. Um, we were then running the stormwater down into uh, the area of the existing catch basin um, where we're gonna replace the structure over here, um, combine the existing catch basin with the water coming off our site and come across the street with three uh, 12 inch pipes. And you can see here, there's two gas mains located 
And from the record plans, we thought they were running right down the back of the, or right in front of the proper lines here down on the sidewalk. Um, so once we got into some further investigation, um, we found out that there's actually one along the back and then there's another one that comes right down into our um, catch basin. So we went out there, dug test pits and found we could probably squeeze the structure in between the two gas lines. Um, we'd have to kind of wiggle it in there. I think we had four to six inches of spare room. I'm getting some feedback here. Um, but the issue then came into is this gas line when we found it was at the exact same invert of these um, pipes. And I think you all know there's pretty high groundwater in this area. Um, it's, it's in the floodplain. Um, there's lots of flooding in this area and storms. So this was actually built with minimum cover. Um, these things had like a foot and a half of cover on them to get across the street. So the only way to get them under the gas line was to go down. Um, but at that point, we're gonna have to pitch the, the, um, the pipes downwards away from it. So we're almost flowing the stream backwards into our st structure and we'd have to get a, a much deeper structure that would be much deeper into the groundwater. Um, and plus we're still also gonna be dealing with the water line that's right here also, if we try to go deeper. So um, in coordination, we were trying to figure out how to better solve the solution. And um, we came up with this one. Um, this one leaves the existing catch basin in connection where it is today. And we um, still collect our stormwater on site. It discharges to a water quality device and we just come straight across um, with an eight inch pipe. Um, we've done test pits here. Um, we can make this work. And the eight inch pipe, it's gonna be ductile iron, which has a much smaller circumference than a 12 inch concrete pipe, which was proposed down there. And you're gonna get equivalent to that. You're gonna get less bank disturbance for this project. Down here, we're talking about like 20 feet of bank. We we're gonna to have to disrupt to install this. Here, we're talking a couple of scoops with a bucket, maybe four feet of bank disturbance. So. We're doing a much, uh, much less impactful project. Um, well, I think we're accomplishing the same goals. Um, mm. One of the comments that uh, William Renault wanted to make sure is that for the water we're collecting on our site, he just wanted to make sure that this pipe was big enough to discharge the storm water on our site for the 100 year storm. And, and we have provided him backup um, information that I believe he's satisfied with, that we are, the pipe is big enough to, to work on our site and this actually does help mitigate the flooding impacts in this whole area. Because the biggest um, issue with the flooding on the street is this whole side of the uh, street floods over at this kind of low point where the catch basin is and um, the, the drain, the pipe gets overwhelmed and then it just flows overland. Um, we, we're kind of the low point for the, the, the abutters here, although the low point in the street is over here, we get all the water from the abutters coming down to our property and then comes back and floods into the street and across. This is gonna provide an additional outlet underneath the street to provide some flood um, some front flood relief for some of the smaller storms. So I've also provided um, updated HydroCAD calculations to William Renault that shows that we're actually improving the situation for each storm event up to and including the 100 year storm. Um, whereas we're not doing as much as we were before, um, what we were doing before we thought was um, mitigating it to the maximum it's impracticable. Um, we've since found that it is impracticable and this is the next maximum extent practical best solution that we think we can solve um, some of the flooding situations out there based on where we found the gas lines to be. Um, I'm not sure how much you follow that, but that's uh, basically the summary of how we got to where we are today. This is a much simpler solution. I believe so, yes. So are you telling me that there is no flooding? You're not causing any flooding? Well, uh, rain causes flooding. So this site is in the 100 year floodplain. If, if there's a 100 year flood, it's gonna flood. We, that was the case in the previous version. That's the case today. We can't solve the flooding problem in this, especially with a project of this scope. Well, um, this well, whole project, this whole area is in the flood zone. This is, would help reduce the flooding impacts when it does flood, and for smaller storms, it would alleviate flooding in the street. You're not getting any back, any backwater effect from having the shorter pipe and backing up the uh, upstream end in a, in a storm? 
uh, we, we've actually picked the pipe up a little bit. Um, we were able to shrink the pipe because we, we were, um, we basically took it as far up to the street as possible. We need to keep one foot of cover minimum. So by the smaller pipe, we're actually able to pick the invert up to make a, more of a pitch over to the stream. So we should be getting less backwater effects in this pipe than we would be in the previous version. And we are providing a backflow preventer as part of this project. In both um, cases, we were doing that. Has Bill we know signed off on this? So we, we, us and Bill have been back and forth for months. I, I will leave that up to Dave, but I believe the last email I saw is that he was, um, a, he um, was for, or he might have tried to lay and say that he agreed that an extension should be given by the CONCOM. Um, that well, was I, I, think, I think he, he said that, and he also said that the, uh, he, he was uh, okay with the eight inch pipe and the calculations that you had, uh, he was satisfied that it, that, 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 that would work. Satisfied that it would do what? It wouldn't that flood. The intent of the previous design with what we were, what we were able to do with the existing utilities. And I believe that's, I provided him a letter stating that it met the intent for what we were trying to do in the previous version. And that I believe he agreed with that. Okay, the original concept behind this thing was to do what? To, to drain the water out of Commonwealth Tanks property? Well, yes, but by alleviating the flooding on this side of the street, you're alleviating flooding in the right of way as well. So you're gonna be in better position with this installed than you are if you do not install this pipe across the street, because there's only one other way for that water to get across the street and it's on top of the street. Right. So we're the local low point for our side of the street. So this is gonna help that situation. Okay, but it's not gonna interfere with the flow of water. No, I provided, no, so what I, I provided, um, I can show you, we have, a, we have a global watershed study we've done for this previously. Um, you can see I've got several acres of here. And this, this study goes back to the previous engineer of the area we studied. Um, and it's about, that's 10 acres, 12 acres. It's, I don't know, about 14 acres of watershed. We provided a model for this, showed the existing conditions and the proposed conditions. And um, the, the letter I gave Bill showed that the existing rates are higher than the proposed rates with this um, design installed. I mean, they're minimally smaller, but that's, that's what we can do. You know, for the for the scope of this project, for the whatever we're in the 15 acres of watershed, we are reducing the peak rates in the ditch itself, uh, which is the ditch is right here. This is Commonwealth Tank right here, and this all goes into this drainage ditch here. And yeah. This is the study point where it leaves at the culvert, and we've proven through calculations that we're making the existing condition um, slightly better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where's the river from there? Uh, it goes further down New Salem Street. It's probably around here. It's not in this picture. It flows through a culvert down into the river. Okay, and so the, the water is gonna flow from Commonwealth Tank towards the river, correct? Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be caught in here. It'll go through a water quality device, which would improve the water quality of it discharge in a pipe at a slow rate across the street instead of over the street, down the ditch and down to the river. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there's no net increase in rate of runoff or anything like that, right? There's actually a reduction. There's a reduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you, and those calculations Bill has looked at? Yes, I provided all the calculations that um, he's requested and to my knowledge, he, he did sign off on that today um, with an I email. Have, I have Bill Renault's email if you want to hear it. Yeah. Okay, it came in today at 2.30, and it's uh, sent to Dave D'Amico, and it says, Dave, I spoke with the Conservation Department earlier today. I am recommending approval of revisions 
as well as an extension of the order to July 1st, 2022, to allow you to do the work in the spring. As the 2021 permit season is currently closed except for all work except emergencies. In speaking with Rebecca from Conservation, I understand they've asked for a summary of the plan changes and reasons for the change from you. Present that and you should be good to go. Mm. Okay. When is the current order gonna expire? November 22nd. Okay. Okay, I, uh, as long as you're not creating a backwater effect that's gonna flood someone out, I'm, I'm okay with it. Are there any other questions from the commission? Any questions from the public? Would somebody like to make a motion to extend the order until, was it July 1st, 2022? I that make a motion. I, I, have one, I have one more question for us, sorry for, um, this was um, this was done, um, how was this, this came about? This was done from, um, um, what am I thinking now? I, I thought this was from done at the state order? level. What, wasn't this done at the state level? Was this order from the state or from us? No, there was other DEP issues associated with the site and some litigation, but the, the D, this was from your commission. It was approved, the order. Okay. okay. All right, good. All right, so we have a motion. Would somebody like to second that motion? A second. Okay, all in favor, Jimmy? Okay, yes. Teresa? Yes. Ken? Yes. And I also vote to extend that order. So we're going to July 1st, 2022. That's what the request is? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. We will take care of that. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Elaine, are you ready to move on or need a minute? Uh, yes, I'm ready. And I think the only thing that's left is the tree removal request for 258 Lowell and 71 Kendrick. I also see uh, Montrose Woods, 313 Wood. Yeah, um, that was, um, okay. So the land in Montrose Woods, the subdivision Montrose Woods, um, eventually went into tax title. And so it's sitting in tax title from the town. And the question is whether or not the Conservation Commission wants to request of the um, town council if they want to transfer uh, care and control to conservation. What's, what lot or what was the address in Montrose Woods? This was, this was the, the, it was the back of the homes. It was uh, like a pet. Actually, this is the, the best case we have for a wildlife corridor because that's exactly what's down there. There's a stream down at the bottom. And I, I have seen where deer have been laying down and stuff like that for quite a while. Oh, this kind of backs up to the backside of Montrose Ave. Yeah. Not is it behind? Well, behind it's behind, behind that row. How, no, it's even. Yeah. You know where Davy Lane is? Yeah, uh, it's over behind Davy Lane. Okay. Um, it's right where the, you know where you have to cross over that road uh, over the bridge to get yep. in the rest of. Well, that that ninety degrees to the road is that there's a long path. A long strip of land that that's the area that I believe this is what they're talking about. But if that's what it is, um, it's a great place for a wildlife corridor. I, I think it would be, you know, too bad if we lose that opportunity. 
Yeah, so I'm looking right now. So you turn um, onto Davy Lane from Butler Ave. Can you show us what you're looking at, Bob? Yeah, I just want to make sure I have the right thing for us. So Gumwood is right off of Davy. All right, hang on. Let me uh, share this. All right, Jimmy, you see that? Um, yeah, Butler Ave. So this is Davy Lane, and you turn right into Gumwood to get into uh, into Montrose Woods. Where is um? Okay, Davy Lane right there, yeah. Yeah, let's go with the, um, let's go with this view. Elaine, do you know what parcel it is? Do you, do you have a map um, a tax? Well, no, you know what? Rebecca has the individual. Um, we have it in large size, but not in a scanned and emailable size. We'll have to find out how to use that piece of equipment. Is it this wooded uh, area, somewhere in this wooded it's, area? It's Andrew? wooded. Bob, it's the area, you must know this area, right? The, the area is all wooded. Yeah, there's, but there's two, there's more than one area of woods that's around Montrose. We've got the side over here towards Montrose Ave, but then we have the side over here on the other side of Andrews. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Right. This one links Sullivan Park. Where is, um, I'm trying to find, we have access, you know, we took a access to, uh, to this area through private property. We, and I, that's somewhere on Davy Lane, I believe, but. So Davy, Davy Lane dead ends right yeah, here. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I wonder if I got it right here. Butler Ave goes up to Davy Lane. Yeah, I was kind of thinking it was on the other side of the Andrews over here, yeah. but. Why don't, maybe um, Rebecca or, or Lane could highlight the, uh, the area that we're talk that, that went up for tax title. And uh, because I, I think it's a valuable piece of property for conservation. There's uh, steep banks and there's, it's all vegetated. Um, there's a stream down at the bottom. We were going to put a, uh, um, at one time we, we were going to put uh, a way to, to um, determine how much water was running in the stream, but that never happened. Lane, you don't have an actual address, do you? No, I don't. And I tell you, this is something Rebecca was looking into. Probably okay. the best thing to do would be to defer it to the next meeting when Rebecca's here. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I would, and I'll get you actually what you probably should have are copies, the large paper copies, and maybe you want to take a site visit there. So I'll tell Rebecca and we can get the paperwork out to you. And if you yeah. want to walk it on a site visit, I think it would be worth your while to do so. Yeah, the, the area I'm thinking about is right where it says Gumwood Lane. Right. That path that goes through that that's the bridge, isn't it? That goes um, over the stream, just just to the left of G on Gumwood Lane. There's like a path, you know. That you can see it's yeah. Okay, you mm -hmm. see the wrong way, isn't it? So, so we have, we have access to that area. And here you're talking, right? Hey, yeah. hey, Bob, can, can I uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. And I think I think we have access right from the corner of that. Uh, oops. Ken's taking over. Jimmy, is this a little clearer? See that? Right yeah, right see there? your I see where your hand is. Yeah, you can see the stream. Okay, he, stop your hand for a minute. Stop your hand. <laughs> go up a little bit. <laughs> go up a, right right there. Go to your right. The right, uh, right there, we have an access that goes right down to the, to this gully in the middle. That's the stream in the middle. 
So, and I know it goes all the way up if you keep going to the top of the page. Yeah, that goes right to Sullivan Park. Sullivan. Yeah. Yeah, this is Davy right here. Yeah. This is Sullivan and this is going. Maybe I'm not, got, maybe I don't have that right. Well, the stream is right where the hand is, the cursor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's another stream too on the other side. Isn't there another the, uh, circle? The east. It goes up to this. Oh no, that goes up to the. No, that's not right. There's one up here. And I don't know what this is. Yeah. It looks spills here. It looks like there's someone this. Yeah, there's a stream there also. Oh, maybe it's on that side. I was thinking it was on that side, but I don't remember. Yeah, maybe it is on that side because it goes right up to another house at the end of the circle. Right. And that's why that, I was thinking was, it was on a Montrose Ave side. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll find out from uh, Rebecca. Yeah. But I, I know it's, you know, we might walked it many times when that subdivision was going in, and it's a great area. And I have seen deer, you know, where they lay down on the, on the grass. You can see they leave an imprint. So I've seen, I haven't physically seen a deer in there, but I've seen the markings of deer. I actually, um, I was recently driving down that area um, on Montrose and did see two deer really? off in the distance. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, there is definitely a wildlife corridor there and on the other side, I believe. Yeah, I would think on the other side too. And um, that's all property that Peter was going to turn over to us. But he right, right. Tax title. Okay. All right. So we'll get more information on that and follow up for the next meeting. Yeah. All right. The um, the last things that I see on the agenda are the, two the other two tree removal requests. Actually, there are a couple of questions too. Rebecca has on here. Uh, but anyways, two fifty eight Lowell Street. Okay. Another tree removal uh, project. And uh, I went out to the property. Here, let me just pull my notes. Okay. So this one, hold on one second. All right. These trees are within 10 feet of a wetland. They're an upland in the buffer zone. The distance to the house is approximately 50 feet, but limbs are falling in the yard uh, with pets and children, dead branches near the crown of the tree. So he has requested, um, the original email said, I want to request the removal of a tree in my yard that's within 25 feet of a conservation area that abuts my property. It has um, multiple branches hanging over my yard, significant lean. Um, and then what I have is an arborist letter from Arbor Tree Service, which reads, after my recent site visit, uh, and then at that point, the number of trees had grown to three red maples. It, it is a, uh, the backyard borders on a red maple swamp. The first tree is approximately 55 to 60 feet high with a 20 inch DBH caliper red maple leaning towards the house in the rear of the yard. This is the initial one that he talked about that uh, is in the backyard um, with the branches falling into the yard. There is substantial heartwood decay, heartwood decay on the back side of it with a cavity the size of a football penetrating deep into the core by 50%. There was evidence of large diameter limbs and branch stubs falling from the crown. The second tree, now this is the one that's in the backyard and closest to the house. The second tree is approximately 15, 50 feet high, an 18 inch uh, DBH caliper red maple leaning towards the rear yard fence and wooded area. This has elevated buttress root, root exposure and the tap root has deteriorated below grade. A density instrument will pass from one side of the trunk to the other 
meeting no resistance. So it's a very rotted tree, I saw it. Yeah. The third tree is approximately 55 to 60 feet high, 20 inch DBH caliper, red maple, on the inside of the yard in decline and leading towards the house. This has major crown dieback through the upper third of the tree. Large deadwood limbs are threatening to dislodge onto the rear play area. In conclusion, it is my professional opinion that all three trees pose an immediate and substantial threat to life, limb, and property and should be removed for the safety and well being of the family. Robert Moses Arbor oh. Tree Service. Now, in this one. Who's finding these pictures? That's me, Jimmy. Good job. It's Google so, Maps. <laughs> on this one, there are two trees that are back into the wetland area in the back, which would be easy candidates to leave um, uh, snags. And I've already spoken to him about that. Uh, and he had no objection. They're beyond a fence that encloses the backyard. Um, and he, and that some of them already had uh, small holes in them from woodpeckers and whatnot. So the ones that are that are not in the yard would be good candidates for that. Now the other one is within the yard, and um, as explained, has a crown that's dropping large branches into the yard. Is that one at the rear of the yard, or is that on the side? That there? one's in the rear of the yard, but within the enclosed, the fenced-in enclosure. Um, one of them may be this tree. And, just look uh, at the area, it doesn't look like there's too many in the enclosure. No, there aren't many in the enclosure. And this was the one that he felt posed a danger to his family. Elaine, I'm the homeowner, I'm on. There's actually a discrepancy to what you said from what is actually going on. I'm sorry, <laughs> what, did I, what did I mix up? Okay, so two of the trees are within the fenced yard. All right, sorry, I misremembered. The it's, no, that's so okay. Two are in the that, fence that's yard, what, and, that's one, and one is in the back. Okay. Yeah, so the, the one that has the um, the rot underneath the root ball that we looked at behind the fence, that's the only one behind the fence. Okay. Um, the original tree request um, that I emailed about um, was the one with the has has multiple like thirty foot branches that have fallen off in the last like the last couple storms have fallen off the top of the tree. And then when Bob Moses was at my house, the arborist looking at the trees, he also noticed the other one with the crown decay, the, uh, the upper third, which is along the, if you're looking at my house from the street along the right side of the fence, like uh, it's maybe six inches away from the fence line. Um, most of the tree hangs over my neighbor's yard and half of it hangs over my yard. Um, so like, if you're looking up the right, the, 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 the west, the east side of my fence line, it's the, it's I have four I have four trees in that little cluster right there. Okay. In that back that that uh cell the north I mean I guess it's the north west north east corner there of the yard. Yeah, da like a little bit south of that. Like yeah, this this cluster right here. There's four trees there. Where the arrow is now is right where the original tree request was from. That tree. Okay. And then there's there's uh, three other trees along the the um, eastern fence line right here. There's three trees there. And the where your arrow is net right now is where that other tree with the crown decay. You can almost see it in the photo where there's no yeah. leaves at the top of that tree. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, so those are the two trees that are of, of major concern to m to my actual play yard for my kids. Um, the tree behind the fence that that I mean Bob took a look he was looking at everything basically and he went back to look at that the roots of that other tree that's uh, pretty rotted out behind the fence and he was like you should definitely be taking this one down this thing's gonna fall any time any minute yeah but yeah so that's that's the situation Where, where's the resource? Does that white fence go into the woods on 
both sides or is it uh like, the, I don't know the fence goes on all the left hand in, on the left on the left hand side of the picture there was like a white fence right is it, that's I the think? same yeah you the, can the, see it. yeah the, the fence is continuous around the whole backyard so it, squ it squares off into like a, a rectangle yes correct so the trees that you're talking about are inside that rectangle yeah two of them are and one is along the fence line in the back like in like in the wooded area but maybe eight to 12 inches behind the fence mm. okay well i think we gotta go back to square one and say you know um is it dead or is it alive or if it's alive we we mitigate for it if it's dead we don't is that the way we're going to look at these from now on yes well, yeah, Desi uh, diseased or dying? No, no, that that was taken out of the policy. If it's dead, it doesn't have to be replicated for, otherwise right. it does. If it's what, Judy? If it's dead, it doesn't have to be replicated, but if it's alive, it does. There's no right. more hazardous tree, no more arborist letter required. That was all taken out of the policy. Okay. Okay, well, what's the situation? So either it's replicated or there's a donation to the wildlife, the habitat replacement fund. So where are the, um, uh, so there, are, Elaine, you said there was some in there that you could leave snags on? There's one, the one that is beyond the fence. Okay, I think uh, we that should one, do that. That one could uh, stand and, and have a snag made of it, I think. Yeah, because I'm look. I looked that up, uh, and I'm, and I know that Judy probably looked it up too. Um, and that looks like a prime candidate for a snag. It's, so I would like to see that done there, at least on that one. The other ones, what's the status of those? The one's got this crown uh, rot issue, right? And then there was another one that's the trunk is rotted. Yeah, so they're dying. The Cool Monty Python, they're not dead yet. Yeah, yeah. not quite dead. Um, Trees take a long time to die. Where is the, um, what is the actual resource area, Elaine, in this case? Red Maple Swamp. Okay, and how far back from the fence is the swamp? 15 feet, maybe 10, 15 feet. Yeah, so these are close. Yeah, very close. But I mean, if they're not going to, if they're dying, you know, there's nothing you're going to do. You just replace them with something. So, where would the replacements go, Jim? Where's what? Where would you replace, where would replacement trees go? I'd put them in the same area there. That's all. I would leave the one for the snag because I, 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 after reading this thing, I think, yeah, that's the right thing to do. And um, if the other two aren't really in a good spot for to leave a snag, then replant with something wildlife friendly it's three trees is that what we're talking about here yeah two trees, one will be a snag. and one's on the other side of the fence yes how many total trees are actually on this side of the fence in this corner two uh oh in one corner there's two inside and one outside that's the total number of trees or that's just yeah. the number of trees there, that want to come down there's there's four trees inside the fence line. Okay. Yeah, because it looks yeah, like but only two. but one is staying, isn't it? I have I have no two two. two are two are staying and two are going. Two are staying. And then one on the other side of the fence. Okay. Right. So the question yeah. is what do we want them what do we want the homeowner to replace it with? Trees, shrubs? 
Well, I don't know, Elaine, what would look, what would work there? Well, I think the homeowner should have some say into what he wants to see back there. I, I don't want to impose trees on homeowners that don't want them. I don't think yeah. that works in the long run. Um, shrubs. Um, okay. I don't know. How do you feel about shrubs? The owner's here, right? Or how do you feel about trees? I, I think the yeah, homeowner's I mean should be part of this discussion. Yeah, I mean, I don't really want to put trees back there again. I mean, the, I have two massive trees in that area that are over 60 feet tall that are staying. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't mind putting so find it a place. I, I have a, a raised bed that I can put multiple shrubs in that I'm, I mean, I've, I've only lived here for two years. Um, I grew up in Greenwood and this is my 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 house now and I, I want to redo the flower bed that was let go for a long time and I want to put a bunch of shrubs in there so I mean if, if that if I can put shrubs there that would be better for for my yard I don't want to put a bunch of trees in the middle of my my backyard where my kids are going to play you know yeah oh, okay well maybe we can stick with um, shrubs type plants that are wildlife friendly like produce something for the wildlife Elaine, you can you can handle that. Yes, I can. All right, so we'll we're saying the three trees can come down. The one behind the fence would leave as a snag, and then we'd look at some sort of replacement shrubs um, in that backyard somewhere. Yeah. the The only other thing I had was uh, the arborist said that if he cuts that tree as a snag it will most likely fall and hit. I have a, a 40 foot snag behind my fence that's pretty close to, to where that tree's coming down. That's probably been dead for 30 years. Um, he said it, will, it might take that snag down that's already alive. Uh, Lane probably remembers seeing that. It, had well, maybe it, has, mul make... it has multiple woodpecker holes it, in it. And... If, if, if we have it as an eight foot snag, it seems to me it should be short enough that it shouldn't take it down. Or do you know what I mean? Or talk to Bob yeah, and but, say, look, yeah, if it Bob comes down, if it comes down to, cut it yeah. to an height where it won't it won't push down the other tree. Right. He was just saying he won't be able to control the fall as well if um if he cuts it higher than he normally would as a regular tree. I just remember him saying that. Yeah, but he can work that out. I mean, Bobby is pretty clever. I, I can't, I trust that Bobby could get what he I know. I, I've, yeah, I've, I mean, I've had him take trees down for me in Greenwood and he's he's the best guy around. So I'm, I I don't trust it. I trust him with anything, but that's yeah. just what he told me when, when he said yeah. that. So we would I, like I wouldn't want to, I, I just wouldn't want to lose that other snag since birds are already living in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, we wouldn't either. So, but we would like to leave that to help enhance the the area. Huh. Yeah, I agree. I I have no problem with leaving it. I just I'm I'm trying to avoid knocking the other one down. That's yeah, all. Yeah, I get you. I get it. Yeah. All right. So Bob recapped it. I think I'm happy. I'd make a motion based on what Bob just said. So yeah, um, three trees would come down. We try to leave a snag on the other side of the fence, and Elaine will look at some replacement shrubs um, that would do well um, in that area. And uh, is there a second? A second. Okay. All in favor? Teresa. Yes. Jimmy. Yes. Ken. Yes. And I also vote yes. Okay. All right. So Elaine, you'll um, take a visit out there and, and look at uh, location for shrubs? Yeah. Excellent. OK. Oh, so I just want to say that um, the, tree would, the trees would come out most likely uh, this, uh, this season, as I understand it, and the shrubs would go in in the spring. That would make sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so Brian Elaine will be getting with you to uh, talk about uh, some shrub replacement. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Elaine next. That would be 71 Kendrick Road. Okay. Now, I, I, I was of the impression that you had gone out and done a site visit at 71 Kendrick Road, is that right? No, actually, you know what? I recused myself from that because they are a neighbor. Did, did anybody go out to that property? No, not me. No, okay. Yeah. All right, so I have a letter here from Keith Tree Service for what it's worth. Um, this letter is in reference to the five hazardous trees in that uh, in your request, all of these are white pines. The first one is at the front left corner of the house. This has stress cracks below the main crotches and leans towards the house. The second tree is behind the house on the right. The tree has a large split in it and is also leaning towards the house. The third is located behind the center of the house has a bulging root mound and leans towards the house. The fourth tree is next to the shed and has signs of stress at the crotch and is also leaning towards the house. Lastly, the one in the front left near the, uh, near the house has a split trunk crown and is a risk to the house. These trees stability are all compromised, considered hazardous, pose a risk to the house and should be removed from Jay Shepard, who's a certified arborist from Keith's Tree. Well, we don't have a, is this something we have to vote on? Because- Well, it's uh, fine. It's, do you want replication? Because hazardous doesn't have any impact anymore because you changed the policy. So if they want to take the trees down, they can take the trees down, but there's mitigation that goes along with that, or they can donate to the, Habitat replacement fund, but no one is rather than take down five trees and get nothing for it. But no one has been out to see to see them, right, Elaine? And we can say no if we want, right? Well, they can take yeah, them down if they want, but there should be some replication. If you're going to take down five trees, yeah, I mean, we should look at uh, the resource area and what's what's out there. Um, five trees is a lot of trees. They're all pines. It's, I don't. I I would want to see it. Maybe I should go look at it this weekend. Okay. You know, I understand that whether they're hazardous or not is not no longer uh, part of the equation. But it also seems to me that I think it should be. I think it, that no, it was if it was taken. Order, hey, just let me finish. If a homeowner just says, I don't like them, I want to take them out, I need your permission to do it, and it, it's a vanity decision, then you lose five trees and you replace them with two large shrubs and three small shrubs per tree. It seems to me that there really should be a good reason to take down a 60 to 80 foot tree and the only reason I could think of that would be a good reason would be if it's hazardous. So in that case, I think knowing whether or not it's hazardous should be part of the equation. Even if it's not dead um, and you replace it, why would you take down a tree that isn't hazardous? Because the commission decided that they were getting a lot of requests for people to simply remove trees to open up their backyard, whatever reason. And they got away from the hazardous because that is what every single person came in with was a letter can saying it's dangerous to my house and it's hazardous. Pull up the policy. I'm sorry, Judy. Can, can you pull up the policy from our website? Yep. Thank I you. Sorry, Judy. Well, we do I have realize to... that everybody would say it's hazardous. See, but I that's why it was taken it. out because it was a bulb. No, I get that, thing. Judy. I get that. I get I'm that. I'm not I saying it's. It, I'm saying but the I distinction think it should is, be put back in. I think it, it should be put have, back in. 
but it doesn't have to be put back in in the policy. They can donate to the Habitat Replacement Fund if they don't want to replace them. I get that, but donating to the habit to the Habitat Replacement Fund is not the same as leaving five trees in your yard. It isn't, but if you, I highly doubt the commission is going to say five is too many, we're not gonna approve it and take the chance that it's not gonna come down on someone's house because that was the argument that drove the revision of the tree policy. That was discussed over, I think, three hearings yeah, no, I remember. I remember. And uh, granted, nobody wants to second guess an arborist, but, but there's no need assuming to. that the arborist is an honest person. But there's no need to have an arborist letter. Every tree is dangerous inherently. That's fine. No, if someone well, wants, but if someone I guess it's to, not. It's not inherently dangerous. I think there's they a dropped huge branches, difference. But if, but if someone All wants right. to take a tree down, they can file an RDA and go through it that way and get the commission's permission. So they no. can take down a live tree if they choose to. I don't think it's a good idea for an RDA for a tree. No, just first of as all, aside, no. I think it's just too much, too much. But then uh, you have something to regulate it by because as it is, it isn't followed up on. That's the problem. People will say they'll plant something and then it isn't done. Um, so well, you, I mean, you, you I, know, we're first, in that situation the first, now. The tree is coming out in the fall and the shrubs are being planted in the spring. Right. And part of the policy is it's planted within six months and it's monitored every six months. That's part of the policy. But what's that got to do with the tree being hazardous or not? Because it has no bearing on whether the commission is going to approve it. And maybe the commission feels differently that they would right. say, We'll leave five trees in and take our chances. I this was exactly. I understand the that it was discussed. I understand it was discussed. All I'm saying is, is that if a tree is not hazardous, I think the commission would want to give more consideration to leaving it in place than if the tree is hazardous. Yeah, can I? I want to interrupt for a second. I think we tend to forget that the whole issue is what effect does that have on the resource area? Right. That's the number one thing to think about. The whole thing should evolve around that. And I mean, if we have, I, I do think that if we have trees that um, someone just wants to take down because they don't like it in their yard, but it's, it's gonna, you feel it's really gonna affect the resource area, then we shouldn't take it down. Can you, can, can you but back? you can't not take it down if it's going to, impact the resource area if it's a truly hazardous tree. You have a really hazardous tree and it's gonna impact the resource area if you take it down, you still have to take it down because it's a hazardous tree. And this is exactly the leave it conversation up. we had before. You can't leave a hazardous tree standing. No, that's not what and that's why it was taken out of the policy because the commission we didn't want to be in all right. Okay. All right. If that's the fine, if that's what you want, then I understand. So my question to you then is, should I stop asking people for letters from arborists? Yes, it, because it was taken out of the policy. Does everybody agree with that? Um, I want to is, is, yes. Is that information valuable in any way? I mean, <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be good to know, right? An arborist would could tell us if it's disease, dying, or, or, you know. But you specifically asked to have this taken out because of this, because then it was a judgment. Is someone going, who's going to decide? And virtually every yeah. tree request has had a lot, an arborist letter saying it's hazardous. Well, not only that, the arborist works for a tree removal company. Exactly. <laughs> the arborist is not exactly, you know, Unbiased. Question: Does do we ever get letters from arborists saying X, Y, and Z tree are dangerous, but this tree is fine, but we still want to take it down? Is that never happen? I it would. It's been my experience that people don't really ask for trees to come down unless they really are, in fact, hazardous. Yeah, but you know what? Expensive. I'm really more interested in clarification than anything else. So if I'm the one who's going out on site, I no longer ask for arborist letters. 
If the tree is dead, it goes out. If the tree is not dead, it gets replaced. Simple is that is, I just wanna make sure that's the way it is going forward. And then in addition to that, does it really make, so the only other thing that you need to know is how tall is it? How close it is to the resource area? Those are my bright lines, right? Elaine, we can decide. In other words, we don't automatically have to grant the right to remove a tree. That's, that's not my question. Of course you don't. I'm trying to get a fix on, basically I'm trying to get a fix on what you want from me. So right now I understand that, and just correct me if I'm wrong. I just, next time I go out, no arborist letter, height of the tree, proximity to the house, prox not proximity to the house, because that doesn't matter. Proximity to the resource area. If it's dead, I just tell them to take it out. If it's alive, then I ask them to come in and speak to the commission and it gets replaced with shrubs. Have I got that correct? Well, yeah, so just a clarifying point, if the tree going to this shows obvious signs of disease or decay or is dead, right? They, they you can tell them to take it out. So all three of those conditions, any of those three. Okay, so, so signs of decay um, would say to me arborist letter. Right, but that because I'm not is, I'm not going to go out there and yeah, say okay. I don't see any sign of decay because that decision should be made by an arborist. I mean, that's then a good why point. don't you take? Then why don't you? So take we're back to an home. arborist letter. Whether he says it's hazardous or not, I would I I'm not going to stand there and say I don't see a problem and miss but a I problem. Don't, that's I don't understand there. the point of the policy if. If replication is part of it, then whether it's disease or not, the homeowner can still take it out. Having an avarice letter, if you say, do you think this tree is diseased, then chances are they're going to say, yeah, it's dropping branches, it could die. That's what's happened. And that's what precipitated the two rewrites of this tree policy. This didn't happen in a vacuum. But, but no, I get that, Judy, I get that. Judy, take but a but you're not out there in the field. I am. So Judy, so I'm, the arborist letter is still in this. It says right, a letter from the license arborist. Is the arborist letter in or out? It says you know what? it's in. No, leave the arborist letter in because that okay. is confirmation about the condition of the, the tree. The second bullet that. talks about the arborist letter. The okay, so now we're back to see. This is it, the problem. Is it, it keeps sort of sliding around. So the arborist letter is useful to know if the tree is dying. But if I go out there, I mean, it's easy to see if a tree is dead. But but if a tree isn't dead as a doornail, then um, then it doesn't really matter, per se, if it's dying, if it's if it still is has some leaf in it, whether or not it's got a rotted core doesn't matter because that tree that may have a rotted core, may or may not be hazardous, gets replaced with shrubs. Have I got that right? Yes, I think you do have that right. Okay, well, we sure so does it make any difference how close it is to the wetland area yes. if, it's a, if it's not a dead as a doornail tree? So actually, hang, hang on, I think I need some clarification here. So the very first statement here, trees subject to this policy, all live trees at least six inches of diameter measured four feet off the ground. That's the first bullet, but the second bullet, I'm not sure what we're saying with the second bullet. If the homeowner contends the tree is dead or diseased and therefore compromised, prior to approval, a letter from a licensed arborist attesting to this may be required. So what is that saying though? That it makes it subject to the policy or it would exclude it from the policy? I think it's another category saying it's, it's again, it's it's disease. It's a, it's a second category, live but diseased. Live but diseased, yes. That's the category. That's the category I'm having some trouble with. So it live makes, but diseased. So it is subject to this policy if it's live but diseased. And you may need an arborist to tell you if it's disease, but okay. So if that's true, then what? Okay, then the arborist letter is back. 
So right. if it's not obviously dead, then there is a there's an arborist letter that says it's diseased. But but on the other hand, why bother to get that letter if it doesn't matter? If it's just the homeowner's choice, whether he wants to take it out or not. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I feel like I'm working with conflicting goals here and conflicting requirements. Yeah. I and so either I need an arborist letter or if it's if it still has some leafing in it, it just it's the homeowner's choice, whether it's diseased or not, in which so case I, I don't I need, need an arborist letter. I guess I need the, the lawyers to chime in on this. Are we saying that? If it is diseased, it still has to be replaced. You know, replication still has to happen. Is that what this yeah. is saying in the separate, separate? That is what it says. If it's if it's alive, it needs to be it needs to be replicated, even if it's diseased. It still okay. needs to be so replaced. So I, I don't need an arborist letter. Because yeah, what else could it be? It's alive or it's diseased or right. <laughs> yeah, you're alive or you're dead, right? It's alive, it's somewhere in between. Dead. Three choices. It's a, so it's a binary thing. I think it's I think it's more to to um, to uh, um, well when you read this thing if the homeowner contends that the, that a tree is dead or diseased and therefore compromised, compromised right prior to approval the letter, down, it, right. the letter is more to reinforce the condition of the tree I think yes. yeah it's just another piece of information that we're but, looking at right. decisions. But we still have to consider that it's the it's the value to the resource area that's important. Right. Okay. I mean, but you do want an arborist letter. I think it would be good. It's kind of a security blanket to me. I mean, I feel like mm -hmm. it helps. But does it change anything? It doesn't change anything, no. but you ne never well, what, know. What, 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 you might need a letter. Some something comes up. No, and it could be a letter saying that it's compromised, but but then you but the letter saying it's disease, it could fall down any minute. And the question is whether we give any, cre any credibility to that. Well, if you don't give a letter, if you don't, uh, you know what, if you don't give credibility to a certified arborist, then what have you got? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, their license on the line here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to make that decision. I have a yeah. question. Do the arborists ever say this tree is in danger? of coming down in the future, but doesn't out need to come down now? Like, do arborists ever say no, that? That would never, no. never okay. happen. Oh, I don't know if that's true. And we haven't I, seen I, that. We haven't experienced that, but it's possible. If, if there's a whole no, more I've, I've there. been out with Bobby. I've been out with Bobby Moses and we've looked at trees and there's, there's trees that he'll tell you need, need to come down or don't need to come down. I mean, they're there to work, but then, you know, they're not going to just chop the whole place up just to get another tree. Not, not, I've never seen that from Bobby. And that's the only one I've, I've really worked with. But their reputation is online too. I mean, if they, if they get out there saying, you know, taking down more than needed to be taken down, word gets around that maybe you don't want this guy. Yeah, I, that's what I had said. They're, they're signing this letter and putting their license on a line. You know, like a civil engineer would with a stamp. Yeah. But, but without that letter, any homeowner can look at a tree and say, oh, it's diseased. I want it down. But it doesn't matter whether it's diseased or healthy. They still can take it down with replication based on what I'm reading here. So that's what I'm confused about. Is this presumptive certainty that you can do that? Or do we still need to approve it? And can oh, we say no? no? Even if it's live or diseased, we, we, every tree has to come before us. I mean, every so we, we can say no. Yes. Okay. So if it's, um, it's kind of piece of information to make that decision, if we can, if we want to say no. Right, and that and that's what the letter would provide, right? Some information, as well as uh, consideration if it's affecting the resource area. I'm sorry, you said along with that consideration. Is that what you said, Ken? Yeah. Yes. We tried to create this policy so that we would not have any uh, ambiguous situations. Hmm. And I don't know that we've done that. No, well, we. All right. So, you know, I don't mind, uh, you know, I, I certainly keep, keep 
working on it and each time it gets clearer. Um, so, okay, I have, a, I have a clearer idea than I did before and I will continue to ask for an arborist's letter because I, I do think that it, it is a factor in the decision. Um, because if it's not, if it's not, if it's a perfectly healthy tree and he can't right. get a letter from no, an arborist. Decide. Right, we may decide no, you, you, can't, you can't take Maybe it. It would be, it, you would be more inclined to decide no. Right, that's, that's exactly right. It's, it's part of the decision. It's the factor in the decision. All right, right. I think I got it. Um, all right, that's fine. Uh, so here we are back at 71 Kendrick. So <laughs> what, what do you want to do about 71 Kendrick? We have to, someone has to go look at it. I have looked at it. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Elaine. Go right ahead then. All right, well then, yeah, give us your assessment. My assessment is exactly the same as Keith. Um, there are ones that are towards the front of the house that are further away from the wetland. The ones in the back of the house are fairly close to the wetland. Mm -hmm. But they are all, um, they, it, as I looked at it, they are all as Keith, Keith's tree described them. What, damaged or? or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I she has a lot of trees. She has, she has far more than these five trees in her yard. And she is only taking out the ones that she is nervous about. The rest right. she is leaving standing. Right. Um, so, you... so the ones in the front of the house do not have as much impact as the ones in the rear of the house on the resource area. What's the, is the resource area or is it buffer zone? The ones in the front are definitely in the buffer zone. The ones closest towards the back, um, they are within maybe 20, 25 feet from the resource area. Okay. And if they come out to answer your question, if they come out, they are surrounded by other yeah. uh, white pines. It, it's it, this house was built in the middle of a white pine forest. Okay. How tall are these trees? I'm just curious. They're all full trees. height. They're all full height, 60, 70 feet. Yeah. And so they're diseased, but they're not dead. Correct. So they, they have to replicate them are pay, are pay, right? Correct. Yeah, we gotta resolve this. We keep going back and forth with this. It's very confusing. I mean- Well, it's becoming clear to me. Yeah. Um, so so it, it sounds to me like the, the at this point, the, um, the key question is, what impact will it have in the resource area? Right. But on the other hand, you know, you, um, if they're, they're trees and if they're coming out, you want them replaced. So what do you want them right. replaced with? Well, I would say, um, you know, go the, go the wildlife route again, because that's really what we need most is wildlife um, corridors and wildlife food. Okay, well, in this instance, in this instance, I think that replacing them with other, it, it, it's a pine, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a pine forest with a house in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So it might be a oh, good okay. idea to replace these trees with other pines and maybe some shrubs, because I always like to throw food in there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, in this instant, I th instance, I think that other pines might be advisable. Yeah, okay. I can All are pine this. trees. Go ahead, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's all, just, just some shrubs and other small pines. Mm -hmm. Okay. But by small pines, you mean pines that don't grow high? No, no, I mean, I mean, uh, pines that are three, four feet tall to get them going. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, actually, I'm picking that size because that is the size of a tree 
that's approximately the same size as a good size bush. And, yeah. and that's why I, not a dwarf pine, but um, a pine of a certain height. And I picked mm -hmm. that size because it was about the same height as a shrub if you want something taller. But um, Mike, I, I tell you the other thing I'm concerned about is you take out five, six, you take at five 60 foot high white pines and you're looking at, I took out some pines in my yard and you're looking at almost a thousand dollars a tree. And so my other concern is if you ask for, let's say 10 foot high, five 10 foot high pines to replace them, I'm not sure you're going to get a homeowner that may be able to put up with that cost. I, mm -hmm. I'd rather get smaller pines and have somebody say, I can afford it and the trees will eventually grow than ask for larger trees and say, well, you know, it's just not in the budget this year. Yeah. Now, I, I understand it's not my place to second guess other people's finances but I do know how expensive it is to remove a tree uh, and five good sized trees is really high. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Is there space on the property where the trees would be able to thrive? Are you just putting trees back where the trees are taken out? I'm just taking trees. I'm putting trees back where the trees are taken out with the assumption that they will thrive in that same spot. And be cut down in 20 years, 30 years. <laughs> well, you know, white pines, I, I think there's a difference between white pines, which tend to be somewhat top heavy and other types of pines, which are broader at the base, narrow at the top. And I don't think create many of the same issues that white pines do. Mm. And I also think we're going to see a lot of requests for white pines because I think there is a white pine blight and it's weakening a lot of the white pines in the Northeast. Mm. All right. So are we set on this, on this one? Yeah, so, so, so a combination of shrubs and smaller pine trees? Yeah. Okay. Yep, I think that works. Okay. All right, I got it. And um, I, I'm sure that we will get more precise with every property. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> We'll be arguing about this for the next 50 years. <laughs> By the time we resolve it, we'll already I'll, have, have a, a spirited discussion, Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? With each one we talk about, I get more of a, I mean, part of this is using my judgment out there. And with every time we talk about this, I, I get a greater sense of what you're looking for. And, you know, and, and it, it helps me in making decisions and recommendations. Yeah. Well, we have to. And also, we realize, you know, we're laying a lot on you, Elaine. Absolutely right. Yeah, we really are. But, you know, it's, uh, it's always going to confront us. So we do have to find a way to be consistent about what we're doing. And, you know, you do have to be conscious of what people can afford. I, I've seen that a lot. You can't, you know, make someone do something if they don't have the money to do it. And planting trees might be the last thing on their mind. So. All right. Is it anything else? I don't have anything else. Rebecca had two other things on the agenda. What? Two questions. Summit and 33 Elmcrest. Yeah, what's the condition? The what does the commission want to do with the following? Uh, 24, when it's submit, do they want an after the fact notice of intent for pergola yeah, the, and fence? 
this is another big one issue. Yeah, and then 33 Elmcrest, they want an after the fact NOI for shed. How do you want to handle things like this in the future? The benefit of an after the fact NOI is to not grandfather location or activities in the future. Mm. So can you can, can you just say the addresses and what 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 are they about? What is it about? Twenty four would have submit was um, tree removal beyond the fence, I believe. That's over behind uh, gingerbread gingerbread factory there. Um, is that the white fence with the small dog run in the back? Yeah, I think that's that one. I think the question is, what do we do about something that was completed without a permit? Do we make them, you know, tear it down, or do we right? Do we no, file, but, do we make them file after the fact? Rebecca's why? point was to institute that condition you used before on the one that was suggested for 109 Farm that if the pool was taken down, it couldn't be put back in the same place. And yep. that run in perpetuity. So in case right. they come back and want a garage or something like that, right. then they can't put it in the same place. Right. But that's it's we're talking about the same thing though, aren't we? Yes, that's what I'm saying. That's why she put them on there as a stopgap in case they want to put something there in the future. So you'll say, you know, this is approved, but we're not going to approve something in the same place. Because it's how many feet from the brook is it? It's close. It's yeah, it's yes, it zone, is. It is zone and, activities. And I do remember Rebecca was concerned that the that the one somewhere down the line, because there's like a patio or or a, a pad for that pergola, that one day the pergola would come down and a garage would go up, for example. Yeah. Right. So with, with the, and, and um, so the theory is put something on you know on record to say this is allowed but nothing else if you say not if you say nothing um the, the fear is that they'll just keep on doing it without approval is that is that is that the idea yeah these are buffer zone activities that happened without our knowledge correct well, you, you, you know, you're always going to have that. I think that right. we have to take it, um, you know, if, if someone does something and it's reported, we just need to handle it like we would do anything else. Right. But this was to prevent down the road, if they do want to put something in saying there was a pre-existing structure here, so we should be allowed to have it in the same place. That's what the point was. I can't hear everything you're saying. Honest to God, my hearing is bad. Um, it's similar to the pool at 109 Farm. You said if that were ever replaced, it couldn't be an, in that same location. That was an after the fact NOI, and yes, yes, and that. this would be the this would be the same thing. And after That's the right. fact NOI, that would have a condition in perpetuity. Right. That would have a similar language. Right. That's right. Saying right. Right. And right. I think that's the way we should do it. And I, I would not make it a hard thing for people to file after either. I would help them to. Right, and you don't think an it, it's not difficult, right? I mean, it's a requirement that they file an NOI. But if we do this, can I say something? Is this an incentive for people to do this without approval before they get it? How would get, how would they know about it? I don't know. I'm just saying it just seems bizarre to me. That's all. Well, it's. I mean, I don't. <laughs> they're required to have a permit, so there's that. So how how would how do we find out about these two? How do we find out about these? Could because you... he came in for a tree removal and Rebecca looked at the aerial and there's a big pergola and a patio. I see. And the, other... and the fence. How did the other one come in? Um, because they asked, um, I, I don't know if they called her about putting in a shed. Someone okay. called about them. I don't know so, if, okay. what so, call, so how she got that call, they... but she got a call. It was a neighbor or they came themselves. I, I'm just curious. Well, I don't know. I, I think these would have to be taken on a case by case basis. If they're yeah. buffer zone activities and there's no impact to the resource area, nor could there be impact to the resource area, I think it's a different situation. 
Right. Yeah, it would be. I think I think in some cases you could issue a letter stating that it was uh, acceptable. I mean, if you had if you had something that had no effect on the buffer zone. Right. Um, why would we want to do it in Hawaii? Why would we? Right. It may that would have been a negative determination of applicability had they come to us. Well, you could even do it as a letter. You That's the one I want to send it. It was right near the brook. No, what yeah. I'm saying is I don't want to treat everything with a, a post NOI. It has to be a case by case no, basis. No, because this gets no, it gets a little crazy for some yeah. of this stuff. To put an NOI out for like a little deck or something, it's uh, that's crazy. Exactly. I I think we can some of them I think we can handle with it just a letter. I think that's the way we should handle it. You don't have to make people suffer through that process. That's what I would suggest is that we, we do it on a case by case basis and we don't necessarily have to go to the hottest form to fill out, try to make it as easy as possible. And you're gonna get people that are gonna take advantage of it, but you can't, you, you can't worry about everyone. Does that sound okay or not? Yeah, that was my suggestion. But what are you going to do that with these two? should be okay. <laughs> what are you going to do with these two? So what's the decision on these two? All right, so what do we have there? I mean, a pergola is not a permanent structure. It's, it's just... But it's on a ground. cement patio. Huh? It was on pavers. It's in a buffer zone. It's not in a floodplain, right? I don't know. Well, have a lane look at them. And even if it's in the floodplain, if I can add something here, even if it's in the floodplain, it's not taking up floodplain storage. It's a concrete pad, uh, level with the ground, uh, with well, some yeah, if that's the case, in it. So yes. the floodplain issue is not a big one. Yeah, well, that, that depends on the circumstances. I, I mean, just what you said is if it's a raised pad or something like that, if it's flush with the ground, yes, you're absolutely correct. There is no loss in storage. But this is this one is level to the ground. It's not raised. Oh, you've already seen it. And they yeah. put a fence, and they, yeah, we saw pictures of this, and they put a fence up in the buffer zone. Okay. And the fence in the buffer zone, it just has to, it, it can't um, inhibit wildlife. So they've got to always have a path. So as long as it, maybe as long as it wasn't in the corridor or something like that. Um, well, we also don't know where the original limit of work line would have been. Um, oh, there's nothing wrong with the fence as long as it doesn't create a problem for wildlife. That's the way the regulations read. Well, most fences, any stockade fence is going to prevent wildlife from getting in or through. But in this case, the fence is running along the property and there's still a corridor in back of the fence. Yeah, okay. That's fine. I mean, it's not something we would have likely conditioned. Yeah, we have in the past, but I don't, I think that's a. I, I mean, it probably would have been a negative, most likely. Yeah. yeah. Unless What's they created. The 20, 33 one? Elmcrest. What is that one about? Judy. Do they, do they want an after the fact NOI for the shed? How do you want to handle like things like this in the future? Can you still have a Google Maps up or whatever? A shed yeah. would be an exempt minor project as long as it's 50 feet away, but I don't think this is 50 feet away. The same mm -hmm. with 24 Winnesemit. Um, an ordinarily exempt minor project, except for its proximity. Well, oh, we got the picture up here now. Sorry, this is one of is that the fence? That's the fence for one assembly. Oh, it looks like is that a garden? He no, it's it a dog, dog run. run. Oh, it's a dog he run. He said grass doesn't grow there because oh. of the shade, and he made it into a dog run. He said, oh, yeah, I, yeah, we saw that one before. That one's kind of a 
bother me. It's right close to the stream. And it's no, how does the wildlife get through that fence? Yeah, that fence should be, it's got to have, it, it's got to be raised up off the ground a little bit. I forget how much it's supposed to be. Elaine, do you know? Well, uh, I, I thought, I thought it had I, to be I, I normally, we normally do six inches because we assume that our wildlife is on the smaller side and yeah. can fit under six it's, inches. It's the other, the, unless, you know, part of the other problem is the purpose of the fence, it, it often depends on um, the size of the dog. If you have a very small dog, yeah, right. a small dog is going to get under the fence and then you say, why bother to have a fence at all? Um, and, then, yeah. and then you figure out what is your wildlife corridor? Does your wildlife oh. corridor come up from the yeah. stream into the backyard or do you assume your wildlife corridor uh, runs along the stream and if something runs parallel to it, then you preserve the wildlife corridor. Right. Decisions, factual decisions you need to yeah. make. Right, well, you know what, Elaine, uh, as I look at this fence, for example, if I look at this fence now, I would say, I see where the pole is sticking up. I would say everything to the right of the pole should come down and the stuff to the left should be, would not block the wildlife. And like you said, if you went, if you went perpendicular to the stream, that would be acceptable to me as well because you're not going to it can go around the fence which are you talking about the chain link to fence travel. Is what are you talking about jimmy the, the chain, link, chain link the chain link we don't know who put that up yeah I, i'm just saying and the the vinyl fence is running parallel to it there's no reason why they can't travel down there anyways it's just got to open up that other end so it can get through well why do you need the chain link fence i wonder you don't need the chain link exactly. Fence. But I'm just saying, if something is an example, if something, if if we were to allow a fence, it just has to not block the wildlife from having a corridor. But so we've already determined we don't want to we don't want to allow this. <laughs> so I, it went, you know, I, 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 I don't know why after the fact it, it won't help you. Because we, we don't like this fence. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't put an NOI after the fact for that. So this is this is Will, Will Matt? You'd probably tell them to take down the chain link fence. I would take down the chain link fence. All right, but that's, as, as far as we're concerned with what we're dealing with now, what are we deciding with those so two she's projects? She's asking, Rebecca's asking, do they want do we want an after the fact NOI for the pergola and fence? All right. Not sure which right. fence. So, all right, Ken, what's your opinion? Uh, I can't, I, I haven't seen what the pergola looks like. And do I'm just looking for photos to see what that pergola looks like and what everything else looks like. Yeah, go, I to guess the, go to the aerial on that. You might see. Yeah, it. Do, do you know the number 24? What? When it, when it submit? I can't spell when it's in it, unfortunately. W I N. I didn't. I didn't realize. Actually, that's what you just. Is that what you just had up? Uh, those were photos, but the photos oh. didn't those show. Are that the homeowner sent us. Okay. That's correct. They didn't show anything else. There. It sounds like here. I can. I get. I have it open right now. Oh, I, I got it. Don't worry. Huh. I can help Chris open up already. I just um, I didn't realize those other structures that we're dealing with. I just I missed that. I'm sorry. Well, that shows nothing. Hmm? That doesn't show a fence or a pergola. Um, the fence I think is backed in a tree line. Yeah. Oh, there's a new condition. This is newer. Oh, there it is. Is this it right here? Wow. Yeah. See, now this looks like a big area. That's pretty big. I mean, that looks like the whole backyard's paved almost. That's why Rebecca was concerned that it could be a garage one day. I assume that's a fence right there. 
I think so. So you, you can see how much of the area it takes. So that's that's different than previous. There you go. Oh, okay. So that that is the pergola. Wow, that's pretty. That one, that one you might want to. That looks like a big project. It looks like the whole yard is pavers or concrete. Yeah, I mean that one there. I think you might want to have someone come in. It's kind of a big project. Is it concrete or is it pavers or pervious pavers? We don't know. Uh, Elaine, did this? Is this what you looked at? Uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that that uh, it wasn't until Rebecca looked at the historic photos that we realized how new it was. But uh -huh. that's twenty four Winnesemet, and yes, there is a pergola there. On a so here's uh, April two thousand eighteen. It's not there, and here is May two thousand nineteen. There. Elaine, were those? Uh, was that a concrete pad or was it pavers? I don't remember. Okay. I just don't remember. Mm. And was that driveway extended? I don't know. I think it was. Uh, well, maybe not. No, no, it doesn't look like it, actually. I just don't see the purpose of filing a notice of intent afterward. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I, it doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. I don't it, understand what, our recourse here. Like I, I don't know what the option is. An enforcement order to tell them to take it out. Okay. That's one. You're gonna tell them to take it out? Is that what you said? No, that, no I'm just saying what's our Ken asked what can we do about this? I said I'm not saying we should do it. I'm saying one possibility is they built this without our permission. Well, look at the pool, two houses down. That I don't think that came before us. <laughs> Concrete apron, big pool. <laughs> I'll, stop looking at I'll zoom in. I'll zoom in. But so if they, if they, if they submit um, an NOI, would there be a chance? You know what I would do? I think I would. I would think I would have him apply, because if you get one person in the neighborhood that has to go before conservation, they're going to spread it around the neighborhood, and maybe. People will be a little bit more cautious. That's my theory. <laughs> so they apply, they come, they come in, we we grant it, and, and with a so we established on, on the record what the story is that they did this I, again. But at, at that point, can we say no? You shouldn't have done this and give an enforcement order. And the other side is, oh, you gave us the good information and we're comfortable with this, right? So we don't know anything about it until we have an NOI. And at least after we have the NOI, we have more meat to say, here's an enforcement order. Yeah. That's true. Well, yeah, we get the pool here at the first house. We get the deck at the next house. We got the pergola at this house. We got another pool, two houses down to the left. <laughs> yeah, people don't realize that they can't. Do it looks that. like we had a pool. On and this how long ago was it done? Out. How long ago was it done? So between April 2018 and May 2019, according to the dates on these aerials. So did they get building permits for the pools? Because I would think the building department would know. Do you, do you need a building permit for the patio and the pergola? You do for the pool. No. Hmm. I don't know if you need it for the pergola and the patio. Well, it's considered a structure under the stream setback bylaw. So if yeah. they're within 50 feet, they would have been subjected to that. It's not a permanent structure though. The pergola is not a permanent structure. It doesn't say that in, under a structure definition. It just says, all right, so the big pool has been there at least two years. There was a pool, uh, two houses over. That's gone. 
Are we measuring distances? Yeah. Yeah, we're just wondering what the setback was. I'm sorry. I mean, we're not. I mean, we can do this, you know, every day and just hunt around and find the stuff, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> find violations. We'll, we'll use the Concom airplane to do uh, aerial surveillance. <laughs> I tried to oh, drone once, get the drone. Get the drone. drone. At least one of us is in front of us. Try to do something. So I don't know. Let's. It's it's getting late here. Let's. What are we doing? We can move on. I if we call, if we ask them to file a notice of intent, I feel like we have to have a full hearing and ex, have to explain. I, I I I I just can't see it playing out. And maybe we need to defer this until Rebecca can. Come and give us her theory. So we're, we're talking about this without her. So I, I, I mean, don't... yeah. One thing we could do is send a letter saying, "Hey, this was not a um, project that came before us. It should have come before us." You know that type of thing. Who's an NOI? Yeah. I mean, if they do an NOI, they've got to get a surveyor in there. They right, They do. They have to do work. And then what? We're gonna we're gonna start putting conditions that they got to make changes. Right, no, I know, and that's what I'm saying. To what, yeah. end? to what end? Exactly. It might just be a case where we send them a letter saying this should have been a uh, permitted project. Yeah, and yeah, because I would like that letter to and to get around to the neighborhood because it well, looks like well, we could send. Looks like we could send one to one, two, three, at least four houses that we're looking at right now. Yeah. We could send a letter saying. This was done without, you know, this is subject to our jurisdiction. You do this without our approval. Please be advised that you violated, I mean, the Wetlands Protection Act. Yeah. And and you could be subject to, well, not much, but. <laughs> yeah, right. Subject to nothing. <laughs> Accountable for everything subject to nothing. Right. We could just say it's a violation. We don't have to say what you're subject to. All right. What's the other one? What's the other project? I've got the other one. On my screen. Um, yeah, it is getting late. Let's... Yes, indeed. It got late for me an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, same here. Here you go. 33 Elmcrest. 33 Elm now, where is that? Where, where is it? That's off of uh, Elm Street before you get to Parker Road. Oh. So okay. Elm Street comes down, intersects with Parker. Parker goes on to 95 to Reading. Yes. Okay. That's... My, my, uh, my kind of my old neighborhood. My, in my neighborhood, kind of, sort yeah. of. So, oh, down there. Yeah, I so know here's a shed at the very end. So what did they do? I'm not sure how this one came up. It's She's saying, do they want an after the fact NOI for the shed? Oh, the shed. The shed and then how do you handle these things in the future? So do they come before us asking something about the shed? I don't know. They must have contacted Rebecca about something. I think we wait till Rebecca can tell yeah. us. Yeah. I mean, here we go again. Shed, shed. You know, I don't know what that is in there. Pool. I tell what that is. Well. <clears throat> So yeah, we have to find out how this came to her. And well, then uh, take we just got to find out what the project is. Yeah, what, is it a project is or it? is it a request? I mean, this this whole wetland. There's train tracks here, North Ave. It used to be connected to the lake at one point. You know, here's your uh, here's your project, 200, 400 foot of power. The whole thing was a swamp at one point in wetlands. And everything got filled in in the 40s and 50s. Well, I think we, de we defer this until Rebecca can tell us more. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. That's all I have can see in the agenda. Uh, Elaine, do you got anything else? No. 
Judy, you get anything else? No. Nope. Wait a minute. What was the uh, what was the outcome on M M Chris? We don't know what we don't know what the request is. Was it, didn't she write it down? All she said was, "Do they want an after the fact NOI for the shed?" Oh, we don't know when that shed went in, or if they're talking about enlarging it, or we don't know how it even came to her. Okay, maybe they want to take trees down, and she saw the shed. I don't know. So we'll talk about it when she's back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because you want to get home. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I actually want to eat my dinner, but that's okay. Oh my God. You eat now? Well, unfortunately, I, I could not, I didn't have time to eat before. So okay. All right. So is there a motion to adjourn? Uh maybe. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I guess so. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Ken, what do you think about that? Yes. <laughs> Jimmy. Yeah. Teresa. Yes. Oh, you know what? What? We Jimmy, started, Jimmy started talking and I think he left. He did. So, all right, so we have a motion to adjourn. We have a second. All in favor, I also vote. We are adjourned. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Talk to everybody in a few weeks. Good night, all.